Tank. I'm Jay Valentine. And this is the R&B Money Podcast, the authority yes. on all things. All things. All things all R&B. Things. Yeah. In the building. Yeah, he's here. <sighs> he's here. Not, uh, not just on live. Not just on live. Not just on live, where he is a superstar, Oh, he's a too. superstar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The numbers are through the roof. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with his help, our numbers will go through the roof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, give us, give us a uh, little bit. You know, this is, this is our brother. I mean, super producer. Mm. Super DJ, mm. an extreme gentleman, artist, artist, yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Mister, I'm giving you Mister. Yeah, you know Mister, I'm I'll take Mister that. Mister, I'll take that. Nice. Nice. I'll take that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I would sir. Bow when I'm sitting down on my throne. First of all, a toast to you, my brother. Thank you, man. A man, toast to you, major you. toast, major toast, wow. major toast, major toast. It's been a crazy three years, man. Mm-hmm. Damn, this is good. He's a smooth, bro. Okay. That's, that's what we do. Got me drinking. Um, and for my last trick, <laughs> in honor. What, what, what have you done? In honor what of have Mr. You done? D. Nice. Mr. D. Nice has a mystique, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has an essence. Yeah. yeah he has yeah. a style. He has a logo. He has a logo. Mm, okay. Only too many, only, no, ain't too many people I know with logos like people. Jay West, Jerry the NBA West, logo, yeah. Michael Jordan is mm-hmm. the Air Jordan. Yeah, I logo. really do have a logo, man. Yeah, you got yeah, a logo, logo. bro. In, in the in like... the logo, <laughs> the logo is a hat. Yeah. Yes. In the yeah. logo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In honor <laughs> of my brother D Nice and his logo. First of all, I'm gonna look like Uncle Ice for one second. <laughs> Come on, Uncle Ice. I'm Come gonna on, give you this Uncle Ice. I can smell a nigga. Smell a nigga with money. Yeah. I'm yeah, go this to, is great. I'm finna go to my bag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And give oh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, and give, yeah. And give some of this. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Look at y'all yeah. looking like Jimmy Jam and Terry. There you <laughs> go. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> I'm loving this. Now, I'm, I'm loving this. Now it's a pop. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Now D Nice is here. Where's your hat, man? I, this is my hat. <laughs> he like, you, see, you see what he's doing? You see what he's doing? <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Come on, man. The oils. The oils. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, he ain't want to mess the hat up. The juice and berries, man. The juice and berries, man. That's just his thing. How you feeling, my brother? Man, I, I feel so blessed, bro. Yeah. You know, 30, this is, what, like 36 years in the music business. 36. Yeah, 19. Wow. Like, first record, South Bronx, came out in uh, 1986. 36 years in the music business, Wow. Man. How old were you? When I was uh, turning 16. You were turning 16? Mm-hmm. Yeah. When your first record dropped? Yes. So I was 15, turning 16. Yeah. South Bronx. South, South, South Bronx. South Bronx. Yeah, it's crazy, man. That's I've been here a long time, bro. Yeah. It's like, I want to, like, we can we can start there, though. We can. Like, what, what was that feeling like, or what was that process like, even getting to where you're 15 years old, getting ready to drop a record? So back then it was different because the music, um, you know, hip hop was still in its infancy. You didn't have like many major labels, you know, vying for like hip hop artists, you know. So we had to record everything. Um, the guy who started my group, uh, DJ Scott LaRock and KRS, they Scott worked in the men's shelter and KRS was was homeless and he lived there. Oh. And um, so that's how they met up, you know. And uh, I was only at the shelter because my cousin was a security guard at the shelter. So the, I literally walked into the music business. Like it wasn't. I was trying to write R and B songs. I I loved like New Edition growing up, and yeah. I knew that I couldn't sing, and I was just obsessed with like reading the credits. And I was like, man, I want to I want to be a writer, you know. And um, my cousin started working at the men's shelter and brought me. I brought some food over to him, and uh, and it's funny about that story. I literally I t- I shared this story with our buddy Dave Chappelle. I was like, yo, he was like, how did you get in to the business? I was like, you know, I took my cousin some food. He worked at the men's shelter. Then he introduced me to Scott and KRS. And he was like, did you hear that? Yeah. He said, you walked, because I walked to get over there. It was like three miles. And he said, you walked three miles with food to feed your future. Wow. And I was like, damn. Yeesh. Like, wow. and that, that's really what happened, man. Like, That's a bar. I walked right there. I walked with this food to feed my future. And like, you know, that's why I never take this business for granted. You know, like yeah. even through ups and downs, I know that. I was supposed to be in this business. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't about money. It was about influence and, you know, bringing generations together. 
you know, when you think about it, my fans are like literally from eight years old to 80. Mm -hmm. You know, not too many people can say that, that they've been in the, in the business this long and, and that, you know, we've had like this, that kind of success, you know, um, as, as crazy as it sounds, you know, back then it was beautiful to just not worry about record companies or worry about what your fans are going to think. It was just purely just making records for the love of music. And um, So and, were y'all making it just for the hood, though? Like, just for y'all neighborhood? Because obviously with a record like South Bronx, right? It, you, you know that's it's regional. Yeah. Yes. But are y'all are you even thinking anything of it other than we about to turn the hood up? So it was always most most hip hop in New York was always regional, you know. Okay. Eric B and Rakim, it was all regional, mm -hmm. regional music, you know. Um, especially Biz, you know. God bless, you know. Rest in peace to Biz Marquis. Mm -hmm. Biz was one of the people that reminded me, even in, in terms of like the way that I DJ. You know, Biz said like, "Hey, when you go into these different cities, respect their music." He was like, "Remember, we used to just be regional." South Bronx, nobody beat the, beats the Biz. Those records were really just New York records. You know, it took a while for it to kind of like, you know, kind of reach other markets. But that was because back then you had to be patient. Like right now, people aren't patient. If that record ain't popping in like two months, <laughs> yeah, it's, right. it's over. Everybody's so on to the next. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then you could put a single out and that and ride that joint for like a year. Yeah. yeah. And it may not pop off. I mean, look at the Wobble record. That record flopped when they dropped it. Right. But the, it was something that I saw not long ago where Tyler Creator... Tyler, the creator, I don't know the exact thing that he said, but, you know, I'll paraphrase. He was pretty much just like, why would I only promote something yeah. that I put my pretty much my blood, sweat, and tears into for a week or two weeks? Yes. Like, I've been promoting this last thing for a year. And I think that's what has separated him, even in this new industry, um, from the rest of the, the, the younger generation sure. and the artists. He has a fan base that's insane. Yes that just rides it out with him, but it's because he's showing them how passionate he is about yes. his music. And just like you said, you can't, like now, if they're not on it in whatever, the first couple weeks or the couple, whatever it is, then it's just, oh, the next thing or that didn't work. No, it's a big world out here. It's a big world. Yeah. And there's someone out there that didn't hear that record that if they heard it, yeah. They may just love it. And that's what and music used audience. to be. Yeah, that's what it was. It, discovery. Know? The discovery of something. Man, we used to work, like, even when I when I uh, dropped my first single as a solo act after doing, you know, I had a couple of albums with BDP. And, and mind you, we weren't really making money back then. There yeah. were no real budgets. You know, when I signed to Jive Records, you know, they signed me for twenty five grand. I had to make a whole album with $25,000, you know what I mean? But, mm -hmm. but as hip-hop artists, we knew how to do that, you know? Like, we didn't go into... I mean, I did go into like some of the bigger studios that were around the power plays and did a couple of things at Hit Factory. But for the most part, I programmed everything at home. And it's funny, like back then, all of the rock stars used to be in all of the big studios. Mm -hmm. And then the hip hop dudes used to be in like these little small joints. And then at some point it flipped. The it flipped. rock dudes were like, <laughs> Absolutely. Ah, why am I spending this budget? Right. right. Then hip hop dudes, because of our egos and like wanting to feel like we made it. Yeah. You're in here giving this budget back to the record company who owns the studio. You're like, it's 360 all over yeah. again. You know what I mean? It's a cold like, game. So, you know, like, I, so I kind of miss hip hop back then for me, which is why even now, like, R&B is just, it truly is like the love of my life in terms of music genres. Like, R&B is just everything, you know? Like, when just growing up, the records that I chose to sample or to, to have an interpolation of it was always like, some R and B stuff that just felt good, like felt sexy and fun, yeah. and and that's what made me happy. And for so you, I was very different than KRS. And for you guys, though, at that time, y'all was sampling crazy. Mm -hmm. It was like no the charge. Wild West. Yeah, it wasn't no because charge. there was no charge yet. Now, I, that was them. That wasn't us. Because by the time I started sampling, all of my records were cleared. Like no one will ever go back and sue me. Like. You know, whether it was the Turtles, that's where I got the bass line for Call Me D-Nice. Uh -huh. I met those dudes, you know, like they were happy. We split the publishing 50-50. Yeah. Like uh -huh. I saw them in Minneapolis. Oh, so by the time, by time your records came out, yeah, we were, we were clear people samples. were already having the clear yeah, samples. we had the clear okay. samples. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and yeah, we were, they were fair, you know, like they were fair. Um, you know, sometimes things that I produced that I didn't get credit for because I, I just didn't have the knowledge of the music business, mm -hmm. you know, like I... 
I worked on a lot of the music for BDP, whether it's I'm Still Number One and, you know, my philosophy, all of these records you may not know, but these were like big records back then. And, you know, I have no publishing on it, you know, no producer royalty, but I don't care. Like at this point in my life, where I am, it took that entire journey to get here. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I happen to like where I am right now. You know, Absolutely. I could be, you know, still in the studio trying to shop, an old, you know, a rap demo and I'm not there. I'm like having the time of my life doing exactly what it is that I love and it's music, you know. And um, So that process mm -hmm. back then, right, when when you were... 15, 16 years old, was it you didn't even know what to ask? Or, or like, can you can you kind of give insight on that? Because we try to we try to make this podcast as if as informative as we possibly sure. can. We want, you know, the new generation to see these things. Obviously, they got a lot more information now because you kind of look up whatever you want to, if you want to. Right? Yes. Now. But back then, right, where you guys are in the studio and you produce a record, does it even cross your mind to say, do I get anything else for it? You know? So, because I'm sure you probably didn't know what publishing was and that type no, of stuff. No, I definitely didn't know what publishing was. I didn't know what those splits, I didn't know anything about mechanicals. I didn't know anything about this stuff. All I knew was, hey, I'm in the studio doing what I love. Mm -hmm. You know, and the finished product, um, it, that's what you looked at almost as if that, that was the master. Was so, yeah. even like in terms of photography, like, I've always been in the photography, and I took a lot of pictures. You back missed then. that on your, you missed that on your uh, on my intro. intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, guys, yeah. yeah guys, really, that part. guys, Dig really good. Uh, digital, <laughs> digital creator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Digital creator. He did do well. That, my, that, that, can, okay. that can be included. Incorporated yeah, I'm sorry. Into so it. much stuff. <laughs> but it, but even like back Renaissance then, Renaissance man. Yeah. You know, like, you know, like I, as a photographer, I, I thought the value of the the image was the actual print. Mm hmm. So all of the pictures that I shot on tours, I can't even tell you. We have digital cameras then. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even know where those negatives are. So it's like, that's the way, that was the way people thought back in the day, like in terms of like artistry. Like, yo, we just went to the studio and made these records. This like, record. we didn't know that hip hop was really going to have longevity like this. Like, because, you know, I'm from that golden era. So that era is right yeah, after. You're from the Bronx. Yeah, I'm from the Bronx, and then that that era is right after the explosion of hip hop with like the Run DMCs and LL, and you know, you never, I didn't know what you know those guys were making. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, back then I I would I had you know gold album. I was making thirty five hundred dollars a night to perform. You know, like because people didn't want to insure hip hop concerts. It was a lot, you know. Like so, when your song is out, when they call me, when they yeah, call when me, I, the nice I was is getting out. like five grand a night. That song was massive. Yeah, it was massive. Massive. It's massive. The number one song, Billboard, like, was making five grand a night because that, the opportunity oh. to do shows weren't there. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, the hardest thing. But y'all doing packed, packed venues too. Yeah, I mean, but then you got to think, like, then people were, like, killing each other at hip-hop concerts. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was different. You know, it was different. Yeah. You know, it was really yeah. the Wild Wild West, which is why, like, the song I produced when I was, like, 18, Self Destruction, mm -hmm. That record was birth. We're gonna do this for yes, oh, please. You, you know what? No, gonna, and and we're gonna take a sip. We're gonna take a sip. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> self destruction. You headed for self destruction. Mm. Yeah, I was 18, man, when I produced that record, and um, you know that song was birthed out of a, an incident that happened at one of our concerts. We were touring. It was called the uh, the Dope Jam Tour, and it was headlined by um, Eric B and Rakim, Dougie Fresh, Kumo cool D. Those were the three headliners, and then we had. Biz Marquee, Ice T was the opener, and we went on second on my group BDP. Yeah. Like it was a dope ass tour, though. Yeah. It was a dope tour, but yeah. someone, you know, at the concert with, with this girl, you know, they robbed his gold chain and killed him. So then, you know, people were coming down on hip hop, and you know, it was very yeah. violent. West Coast was violent. You had NWA. Like it was mm -hmm. just, it was different, bro. Like as much as people hate on on Puff, you know, and like oh, he changed it to the to the shiny suit. Yo, to be honest with you, it was kind of necessary at that point. You Absolutely know, like necessary. To, yeah, to to bring some love and to and to get to the next level. To get to the next level, man. You know, um, but that record, self destruction. Yeah, that was birthed out of you know that kind of incident. So, you know, that sold nearly a million copies. You know, I did get mechanicals off of that, but we actually yeah. I was donated, about to say, did you get paid off that one yet? We donated <laughs> all of the money to okay. the National right. Urban League. Okay. Yeah, okay. like okay. everybody, we just yeah. donated all of it. Yeah. But, you know, you still get your mechanicals and. um 
and you know still get publishing off of it but royalties we donated like a million dollars close to a million dollars which was a lot back then absolutely a lot right now yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he says a lot yeah, right yeah, now yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but nah it's, it's it's funny how how it all works though bro because it as much as i love hip-hop and that i was a part of hip-hop culture hip-hop wasn't always good to me hmm. you know what i mean like making the records and then by the time I was like 23 years old, you know, I was considered old school because I'd been in the business for so long. And, and um, you know, like, what do you do when people stop clapping for you and no one wants to give you a shot? So that's why I said this journey is so special, bro, because when people stopped rocking with me when I was like 23, I don't want to say everyone, but like no record company wanted to give me a deal. You would think that I had like, you know, like this whole negative background and I had none of that, but it was just the fact that even you, though I you was young, a new toy. yeah. When I yeah. everyone wanted the new toy, the pretty girl that walked into the room, yeah, you know, yeah. like, and because I was, but I was still young, which is crazy. But you it were, was old. You but were it, old school at twenty three. I was old school at twenty three, so it was, um, yeah, yeah. That was a tough time, you know, like. Well, I mean, yeah, we gotta get yeah, into you gotta that give, time you gotta, yeah, yeah. That's I think, you know, that's a pivotal moment moment for most artists, yeah. deciding what to do in that dark place. Because the lights are not always on, like you said, no. they're not always screaming for you. No, and no. in that place, you gotta, you gotta make a hard decision. Yes, am I gonna go home? You know what I'm saying? Am I just gonna be the musician at at my family's church? And it is what it was. I tried, or am I going to figure out like, a did, way? Did you to take, stay in this? Did you take like, like what's the craziest event you may have taken, in your opinion, in that moment? Like, cause you're a DJ. You're DJ, so you can always DJ. I wasn't a DJ, a DJ then. then. Yeah. So you weren't a DJ from the rip? I was a DJ for KRS. I was a show DJ before I put out my solo records. I was a show DJ and producer, okay. meaning I only had to play the songs that we were performing at the show. You were never spinning at the club? No, I had never played in the club. I had never, ever oh, played in the club until I became this guy. Like, I was never in, yo, I'm going to do a show and then do an after party somewhere. Like, no, I was producer. Mm-hmm. KRS is DJ. Young, playing those records yeah, that we had. Yeah. That was it. Because I think me seeing you as I'm a young young kid and your song comes out, My Name is D-Nice, I knew you as the BDP DJ. So I'm like, yes. he's a DJ who just happens to have a song. No. That's how I looked at it. No. I don't know if that was promoted that way through the label. I'm not sure. No, I just but think that's all people it, knew. But it looked, yeah. yeah. It yeah. looked like, oh, okay, he was on this. From, because you would never be now heard me would rap. Be, yeah. Khaled or you know what I mean yeah. like a drama now stepping out onto the artist side but I just looked at you as a DJ yeah yeah I was a jack of all trades you know okay um before Scott passed his whole you know I used to be a little upset like yo when are y'all gonna let me rap on because I never really rapped on BDP songs man you know like it's like yo when are you gonna let me rap and Scott was like hey you know your job is like if something would happen to KRS and you would be the rapper if something happened to me you'll be the DJ literally that's what he said to me and, you know, unfortunately, he lost his life, and then I became the DJ. Became yeah, DJ. But I wasn't, you know, compensated like the DJ. I was compensated like, yo, I work for BDP. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't knock that, man. You know, I was I was young, you know, 17, 18 years old, touring, got to experience the world, and then it made me want to do my own thing. And, um, you know, doing you know doing shows back then as a, as a rap artist, I was just happy, you know, like I was able to tour with, you know, without KRS, you know, no disrespect, you know, yeah, yeah, um, but to stand on my own, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I toured with, you know, I did a 75 city tour with Ice Cube and Too Short. It was like Me Cube, Too Short, Poor Righteous Teachers. Yo Yo was the opener. Um, <laughs> this is, like, yeah, this you know, history like, is amazing. It's crazy. Yeah, you know, so I've, I've seen all of that. You know? And this is all before you're 21. Yeah, but then, you know, wasn't a lot of money being made, mm -hmm. you know. Because like I said, I was doing those shows for like five grand. You know, there were no corporate shows. There, you know, you you could charge ten times that amount. You know, once your shows were over, that was it. You know, and um, when I was considered old school, you know, I had you know I didn't own a home or anything at that point. I was renting, so I was able to like save some money, and then I I, I bet on myself, which is which is another important moment in my my career. You know, I had no health insurance. I had none of that, and I just. I had this money saved and I was like, yo, I'm going to try to put out my own record since no one wants to. And I put out this record. I put out this record and it it was like, yo, the joint was on radio stations everywhere. I had no promo. They were just playing it based on Your the fact name. that it was D-Nice. Yeah. 
back then you didn't have MP3s, so you literally had to do deals. You had to get your records printed, pressed up, of course. go through a distributor, and then they would ship them to the record stores. I had 100,000 units printed, shipped, and they sold through all of them. But I never got the check because back then, what? You, back then, you know, distribution was some gangster shit. You know, absolutely the straight gangster shit. So if you don't have something else coming through the pipeline, they ain't trying to pay you. You know what I mean? And I didn't have another record coming back. The money that I was generating from that was what I was going to use to use. to to record that next thing. But because I didn't have that that other record coming, it was like they didn't answer the phones. You know what I mean? Like the distribution company didn't they just, answer. They anymore. ran off with the bread. Yeah, that was it. And that that's when I went into the depression because I had, I really banked on starting my own thing. You know, like back th- back in the in the in the eighties and early nineties, you had like Dick Griffey and like all of these R and B dudes doing solo records. Mm-hmm. And you had Clarence Avon, but we all know that it started from somewhere. But like they definitely had a little bit more kind of muscle and background, you know, mm-hmm. than I had sure. trying yeah, to do this doing it on, your own. on my own, you know. And that that actually that kind of put me in like this real funk of like, you know, I was depressed for like about seven years. Really? Yeah, yeah. About, it was about six and a half years. Yeah, seven, close to seven years. Yeah, I was, I was in deep depression. So no, you, actually, five and a half years, because then I jumped into web development. So mm-hmm. you doing any music during that time? Yeah, man. Like I had lost everything, bro. Like I was literally like, just with my ex, and you know. Living, I had lost my crib, lost my car, yeah, like everything. And so you're not, so you're not DJing either. No. So it's not like you're trying to go grab. That's why I remember I asked. Mm-hmm. I'm like, were there anything, any like random, no, bar mitzvahs that somebody can pull up and be like, D nice, he was, spent, no, yeah. yeah, none of that, no, nothing. That. Mm-hmm. All I lived off of was that quarterly publishing check that. You know, slowly, slowly got smaller and smaller, smaller and smaller. You know what I mean? Where like, yeah, it was it was a it was a rough time. But like I said, man, I have no regrets, bro. Like, I'm not here without all of that. Hundred percent. You know, like without those lessons, I, I because no one, no one believed that this was gonna happen for me or or the web development, which saved my life. You know what I mean? Like, I guess when I met you. Yeah, when I so how I met you. What year was? No, this was two thousand. This was two thousand. Mm-hmm. At that point, I was already doing websites for 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 Black Round. Mm-hmm. So like, were you was this was this your climb back up or like out that of was that my depression? climb back up? So what happened with that was around ninety eight, my best friend who was managing me. Well, he was a partner. I've always been like self managed, but back then we were partners in the management company, and um, yeah, he was when we stopped doing music together. You know, years later, he formed a company called Trendsetters with like four guys out of Toronto which was very important. You have no idea how important you and your and the whole black round was to me. Like that moment was, um, you know, he, Tony is, is his name, still one of my best friends. Um, he called me up and he was like, hey, I'm involved in web development. You know, I know you probably need to make some money, which was probably his way of like kind of repaying me for, you know, we had some great times, you know? So now it was his, it was his time to yeah. like look out, yeah. like, yo, I got an opportunity, you know, maybe with your connections, you can go and, and make some introductions and then we'll give you a piece of it. And I was like, all right, cool, you know? And, you know, I started making some calls. It was weird at first, you know, like people thought that I was calling to sell a demo or something. And I was really on some like, yo, like, nah, I'm a part of this organization. This is yeah. what we're doing. The one person that gave me the shot shot was Jomo, Jomo Hankerson, yeah. which was Barry's son. Um, mm-hmm. To all of you that don't know, Barry mm-hmm. Hankerson's son, he, uh, we were competing. And at that point, I, I didn't know anything about programming, but we were competing. Um, this trendsetter company, which we had renamed it Boom Digital, versus uh, an old company. I mean, they no longer exist. Called Razorfish, which was like the top top. You know, they were killing everything. And you're talking, those deals were like multi million dollar web deals. Like, like now you got like Squarespace. You could just put up a website. Right. Then you right. literally had to yeah, program. Really. Yeah. So. You know, Jomo told me, he was like, yo, you know, after meeting with him over and over again, he was like, you know why I'm going with you? He's like, I know you don't know how to build a website. He's flat out, flat yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. He was like, but I know you will make sure that your guys give me what I need. And I'm not going to go with Razorfish. I'm going to go with you guys. 
that changed everything. That conversation changed everything for me because it. Now, this is an R&B company. You know what I mean? Like, this sure. straight R&B. Yeah. Legendary. <laughs> Legendary R&B. But those words was someone betting on me. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and you know, when you are, when you've had, like, failure in the music industry, you felt like people turning their backs on you. To have a conversation like that when they were on fire, you know, obviously, I think at the time he was, they were still managing R. Kelly. Um, then they had Aaliyah. And they had you. Your stuff wasn't out yet. Yep. Missy or no Timberland, genuine, yeah, genuine. genuine. Like they were on like, fire, yeah. fire. Yeah. So like to have the company. Oh, what was the rap group though? Who was in that joint? Was was? Oh my gosh! The, it was like the, the, I remember the picture in the water. The rap group, the white boys. No, it was some black dudes. I don't know if Two Chains was down with it. It was a rap group. Two Chains might have been in the group. Yo, it was a rap group from back then. Oh my god! On, on I, but at the end of this conversation, I'm gonna look. It oh, up. it was um. It was Statics. Uh, it was Statics Group. Statics Group. Uh, oh, what you was know what the I'm name? About, Absolutely, right? <laughs> absolutely. They was out. They was out of Louisville. Absolutely. Yep. 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 Uh, oh, what was they called? I can't remember what it was called. But no, Two Chains wasn't in that. But it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. It was, it was Statics like conglomerate. They were mm-hmm. like a coalition, like rap coalition. Like yeah. they was hard though. It was like it was hard. Yeah. And they, yeah. they had these pictures. Yeah. Under, they were under the water. Like yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> coming crazy. out of the water. Like it was crazy. Yeah. But anyway, so like you know. That gave me my own confidence. And I was like, man, he really believed like that, you know. So I went from like making like $750 a month when when I was just like helping the guys out. And then, then I started making like $1,250 a month. You know, like now I got a little bit of money to, you know, I was still stay. I was moved back in with like my family, but to take care of my kid. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I saw what was happening. And I was like. Because you had your daughter by this. Point. My daughter was there. You know, my, my daughter was born in 96. And, uh, you know, luckily for me, man, like I didn't have, um, you know, my ex wasn't, she wasn't on me about child support, you know, mm-hmm. like she understood what I was doing. She was like, yo, you know, whatever you make and whatever you can give, you know, that's why like when I started making money, I gave, I gave it all. Like, nah, we're going to make sure our kid graduates and we're going to, yeah. we're going to do all of that because without that kind of like support, even though we didn't make it, but still without that kind of support. Absolutely. Your mind isn't clear. Yep. Yeah, no, you know, she could have helped keep she helped ultimately get you out of the space, mm-hmm. but she could have assisted keeping you in that space. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So you shout know Shout out to her. Yeah, shout, shout out to her, her. shout Absolutely. out to the family. You know, um and the other thing that was important during that time was um because Jomo said what he did about I know you'll make sure that we get what we need. I used to sit in the office and watch the guy's program. And I was like, oh, so that's how you write code. Oh. And then they didn't know, like, I was going. It made you learn. Yeah, I was going out and buying books on HTML, you know, PHP. Flash was new at the time. You know, I was downloading source files. You know, they used to have these websites where somebody would write a code and just post it for free. And then you can just pull it and, like, you know, kind of, like, make changes and do whatever you want to do. So I learned all of that stuff, you know. So within like one year, I knew how to write HTML. And I just knew, like, just from learning. So then that gave me leverage, like, with my, within my own crew because most of the deals that they were getting were deals that were... And, you know, and by the way, my, my buddy Tony was always on my side. Like, nah, we got to make sure we take care of you. The mm-hmm. other guys, not so much because they... That's what they did for yeah. a living. And they weren't and they, your guys. No, they weren't my he guys. Was, but yeah. he was my guy. He was like, nah, we got to make sure... That D's a full partner, and those dudes didn't want to make me a full partner, and then I left and started my Tank own. Tank and thing. I both know about guys not, you know, <laughs> make, yeah, you man, one in this, make you a full partner and share in the in the, in the wealth. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, we all we've we've all been there. Yeah, been there. <laughs> I left, and then I started I started my own company called United Camps, and I never I didn't go to the clients and say, hey, don't work with them. I was like, I'm just gonna do my own thing, you know. And I, I went to Motown, my first. The first project that I did for Motown, this was under United Camps. With what we did for you guys was Boom Digital, mm-hmm. but under my joint, the first artist it was uh, I. W- I didn't even have a computer. This is how like my life is just oh, you divine, bro. Stuck in it. I didn't have a computer. I was using their computers to learn. <laughs> but when I started my own thing, I didn't have any money. I, all I had was just good credit. You know what I'm saying? Right, like right. Dell computers. I w- first I went to Motown, and I was this woman that used to work over there named Kelly. She was like Eddie F's assistant. I was like, listen, 
on the pop side, they're doing like these these flash evites to promote artists, where artists can you can use like these flashcards and like you can have your album on there, like snippets of it, and you know people can preview it in the emails. But they weren't doing that for hip hop and R and B, and I was like, yo, you know this is it right now. This is how you're gonna market things. You know, like you should you know let me do it. And she gave me a deal. It was like five grand for me to make, and the first artist was Rashida, the rapper. Rashida. So yeah, that was like the first project yeah. that I worked on under under United Camps. And man, I did that and then Motown gave me their account. So then I started doing like Queen Pen and like a couple of movie projects with them. And then I picked up J Records and I did Alicia Keys site, mm -hmm. Diary of Alicia Keys and Boyz II Men and Luther and Annie Lennox. And now now I'm making money because those sites used to cost money then. It was like minimum six figures. You know, and it was all because of a conversation I had with Jomo, you know, like, yo, I know you'll make sure it, it, it'll be right, you know? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So there's so many phases to my career, man. It's crazy. So what moved you into fully DJing? What was, uh, I was going to say what moved you into photography. Oh, yeah, because, that that, yeah, 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 yeah. I skipped yeah. a step. I did yeah. skip a step. Photography happened while I was, it was a client. It was a men's underwear client. They were called Down Under Gear. Damn, I remember that. That's crazy because this is around. Were they 2000. from Australia? No, it was some black dudes out of Queens. <laughs> <laughs> they just wanted down to. Down Under. They just it wanted to call sense. that thing it Doug. Makes, yeah. And it was Down oh, Under shit. Gear. They just wanted to call it Doug. <laughs> and it was just like men's men's underwear. You yeah, know? yeah. Shout out to Doug, man. And, and they <laughs> when they sent over the assets for me to use to build um, the website, I thought the pictures were just corny. So I was like, hey, just pad the budget with like a thousand dollars. And I went and bought a camera. And then I hired a model, like this black model, this dude, like this African guy, you know, he was a handsome dude. I was like, oh, he looks like one of these like underwear models, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? But I don't have Calvin Klein money, so he's gonna take this Doug dollar. <laughs> you know? This Doug dollar. <laughs> <laughs> take this Doug dollar. He'll take this Doug dollar, bro. <laughs> Shit. Yo, we okay. went to Central Park. I'm photographing the dude in Central Park with like in his underwear and bathroom. It was just straight up. I mean, looking yeah. back on it, it was so guerrilla style, but gorilla, I didn't care. Yeah, All yeah. we needed was like a but couple the, of pictures. The best things come out of yeah. that yeah, type yeah. of shit, though. We yeah. didn't have to have a full on photo yeah. shoot. The lighting was all off. Like, I didn't have lighting, no assistant. I'm just out there like taking these pictures. But to me, the secret was to just turn everything to black and white. Like, then, the, then. Those the, the the lighting like you know it becomes it fixes like, things yeah. yeah it's more interesting the shadows like so because of that because of that experience <laughs> now I own the camera I was like all right I, I kind of like this photography thing so I went to school for photography while I was building websites I went to this place in New York called ICP International Center of Photography and I went there for like a year and um you know learn how to process film learn composition. And all of that, like, it was just great. Like, that's what I would do at nights. Like, like I was a college student, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But it was just for photography. Are you, are you moving under the needle as you're doing this? Or are you running into, hey, are you D-nice? Are you running no, into no, that at all? No, no one no one knew I was, you know, they. it was a while. And, and the fun, the transition from from uh, from that part of my life into DJing is when it, it when it hit me. It and I'll get into that. D-nice. Okay. Yeah, you did. You I, asked, I was like, yeah, you didn't know that. Ain't you? <laughs> I know you. You do websites? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um the photography, which is which again, my my buddy, God bless the dead, my man Chris Lighty, he um he was getting married in my in uh, Miami at this museum. And he invited me because at that point I was already like building websites. I was building the Violator website. Mm -hmm. And Chris was like, you know, we'd known each other. He was one of my one of my closest friends. You know, when I was married, he was my best man. Like, the dude was like, yo. Yo, he sent me an invitation to his wedding. So I didn't have, you know, all your R&B and, and music industry dudes was making so much money. I, and he was registered at like this crazy place, ABC Furniture in, in Manhattan. Like everything on the registry was like 5,000. I'm like, I don't got 5,000 to buy this man a wedding gift. Like this is crazy. So I was just at the wedding just taking pictures. Like I, no one even knew. I mean, a couple of people saw me taking pictures because I would ask them to pose, but like, Chris didn't really, he wasn't paying attention. Right. Then my gift to him was just this photo album. And I was like, yo, yeah. here's, here's, yo, here's the gift, man. Like, then he called me and was like, I guess he was watching it, you know, with with his with his wife, and he was like, yo, I paid all of these people 
mad money. Yeah. And they caught none of these images. You should actually be shooting professionally. And I was like, nah, I'm good. I don't I want to be a photographer. He's like, man, take the bag. And my first photo shoot for him was uh, one of 50's Reebok campaigns. Wow. You know, so even on the photography no level, way. I was doing like that. Then that's crazy. And then um then Tyra hit me up and was, you know, she she saw. Oh, my she's black gonna go for 50 Tyra. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I mean, you know, okay. I, just, I, like, I saw what you did. You the, yeah, you know. <laughs> I started <clears throat> shooting album covers and you, do you feel that? Yeah, well, but, it's but, but Tyra, do you feel it's that Tyra? You feel, you feel it? Okay, because you got a hat on, I don't. Uh, so <laughs> you can feel Yeah, you know I mean, I might I might get a Michael Jackson uh drop curl in a minute from the champagne that's falling on my head. But yeah, yeah, you just went from fifty cent Tyra Tyra. Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, I mean, what you I mean was, was, the, was the model Tyson Beckford that you shot in Central Park, man? And no, shit? he wasn't Tyson. Though. <laughs> it, it did look like him, but he, wasn't, he didn't have Tyson's money, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, he yeah. took the Doug dollar. Yeah, he definitely took the Doug dollar. <laughs> but um, yeah, Tyra, Tyra was awesome, though. You know, she asked me to follow her around, mm -hmm. you know, from, you know, she was like, I want you to come over to my house and just photograph me, you know, from like a full day in the life of Tyra. Yeah. And I did that. And she loved the images, and she was like, hey, I want you to, can you shoot for my talk show? Then I went on, I photographed 50 for a talk show, I photographed Hallie for a talk show, and then Tyra was like, hey, can you do America's Next Top Model? So that ended up being a, um, that's a source. on Cycle 14. That's, a sore, that's a sore spot for me. Huh? That's a sore spot for me. Why? Were you on there? No. No, <laughs> I wasn't. But, uh, <laughs> hey, you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. Did you not win? But I'm going to talk about... <laughs> Did you not win? I, I didn't win. Did but, you um, win? Tyra actually asked me to do the theme song. Oh, wow. Mm -mm. You had an opportunity to I do I never the told you that. <sighs> Wait, what happened? Why didn't you, you do fumbled it? the theme song? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, um... Shout out to my brother, Shakir Stewart. Oh, wow, yeah. And my brother, Kenya Barris, yes. who uh, at the time he was working with Tyra. And we used to all, you know, we should be kicking it. And Shakir had put me on, you know, connected me with them. And we brought, you know, Tyra was like, she wanted to sing. She wanted to sing at that time. And she came to the studio a few times. We worked, we worked a little bit. Okay. And she was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing this 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 TV show. And I'm like, oh, okay. She was like, yeah, it's about like models and this whole thing. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, TV show, models. I'm like, well, who's going to sing the theme song? And she was like, she's going to sing the theme song. I was like, whew. Um, <laughs> you sing? <laughs> Even though we had been Yo. already doing songs. I'm like, you know, because I'm thinking it's, you know, for fun and it's a whole thing. And I'm like, ah, I don't know about just doing, you know, because obviously growing up, you watch these shows and you watch different TV and you think to yourself, these songs aren't really songs. They're just kind of like, mm -hmm. and I think at the time I probably had been watching the Jamie Foxx show where remember he had the, he was, a, he was making jingles, yep. yeah. but it didn't seem cool, right? right? Yeah. The jingle thing didn't seem cool. And I was writing real records for real artists. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't write jingles. So I didn't write the damn jingle. And <laughs> I ended up running into Tyra a few years ago. Um, of all places at Jimmy Iovine's like Christmas yeah. party or something. I don't know what it was. And she was like, yeah, you remember the whole theme song? <laughs> You know we're on like season twenty seven thousand, right? And I'm like, Fuck. yeah, you definitely fumbled that one. <laughs> oh, oh, I fumbled. Yeah, but yeah, so yeah, America's top model. You know, that's that's yeah. you know, it, it happens. It happens. I think. I don't know if it no, happens. No, it doesn't always. No, happen like okay, that. fine. It's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> fumbler. Yeah, right he's a fumbler. <laughs> You fumbled too, man. Shit. Yeah, but sure, wait, which one did you fumble? No, his fumbles are way crazier than mine. Give me I mean, one of yours. Um, I fumbled an audition. I fumbled two auditions. Probably the worst fumble was the Stump the Yard audition. Oh wow! <laughs> wait, what? 
Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Before you tell a story, let me let me get a drink. Shut up. <laughs> Cause you stumped the Shut yard. Up. First of all, this this is already very tricky. Were you <laughs> buff at the time? No, nah, I it was I was tank. Of course, I had I had the muscle. So you were buff. Okay, buff dancing. Go ahead, go ahead. Go um, ahead. so I literally shot a Twinkie. Um, I literally I had the part. Oh, okay. I was, I was playing the part of Darren Henson. Okay. Dan, okay. Dan okay. Bar. I can see that. Yeah. I can see and that. All yeah, I can I, see that. Yeah. All, yeah. I, I knocked all the all the um all the audition down. Knocked it down. They're like, oh, you're in. You're the guy. You're the guy. You're it. Okay. So um last thing we're just gonna do this dance audition and then and you'll be good. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I can I can knock that out. I got rhythm. You know what I'm saying? Um I had rhythm, but I don't know how to freestyle. Okay. So in my mind, I'm like, okay. This is a dance movie. I can step, but I got to be able to really, you know, deliver it. So, you know, I saw, I called Christy and Dave Scott. Listen, I need an eight count. I need a real eight count so I can dazzle them. So um, I can dazzle them. <laughs> he wants to dazzle niggas for Stump the Yard. But go ahead. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, you want to get spirit fingers. I want to be dazzling. <laughs> um, and so I go in. We get rehearsals, rehearsal for a couple of days. No, rehearsal the day bef- day of. I learned the routine. I learned the eight count. I'm killing it in rehearsal, killing it, right? But I'm very like, I'm, I'm OCD in a lot of ways, right? And so a lot. Of, uh, go ahead and turn and, the bottle. In a lot of, <laughs> show like, baby, this nigga crazy, man. This in nigga a be, lot of ways, he be turning have, the salt shakers and I, shit. I have severe OCD, right? And so, you know, with the choreography. Once you teach it to me in a certain space, it has to be in that space. Mm. It has to be in that space. It has to start exactly where that one is, exactly at that measure where the music does whatever it does. I, I have to, it has to be there, or, or I malfunction. Wow. And so they said, "All right, let's go." And when they started the music, it was okay. No, give you some backstory. This will really help you with the fumble. Okay. E League game on Sunday. Okay. Okay. I'm going crazy. The guy checking me, you don't want this. Mm, body, get off me. You can't hold me. Huh? You know you're dealing with? Yeah. Mind your business. Win game. Go home. Right? Next day, dance audition. Guess who's the director? <clears throat> oh, the <laughs> nigga who got the buckets? The who got the, I got the buckets. <laughs> oh. And he's giving me this. And I'm like, you're in my house now. Yeah. I was like, hey, man. Hey, brother. Hey. I didn't mean that shit yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> was that Tim? Did Tim Story direct that? We're going to find out. We're going to Google yeah, that yeah, shit. Yeah, I'm definitely going to Google so, it. <laughs> he's a director. And I'm like, oh, my God. Right? I didn't know. Yeah. So they're starting the music. And they start the music low. I'm like, turn up, turn up, turn up. By the time they turn up the music, I've missed the one. You missed the one. The one that I need to start mm-hmm. on in order to be dazzling. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh no, 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 we got we, we can start over. No, no, it's fine. Just to start where you are. I said, no, I, I really need to start up. Just start where you where we are. I'm like, ha ha. Ah. <laughs> ha ha. Ah. <laughs> And everybody, everybody's going. Like, oh. And they turn the music off. Yeah, they turn the music off, and I just, I just looked at everybody and I said, "Thank you." Thank you. And I just walked the fuck out. <laughs> you wanted them to believe that that was your freestyle, and they never called me again. <laughs> I love it. There's some. Listen. There's somewhere this tape is gonna come out, oh, and it's man. gonna be bad. I hope they burned it. This director, it. nigga, gonna <laughs> see this and be like, oh, yeah. The country might know yeah, what it is. She, she was there and she was like, she called Christy and, and Dave and she said, what the fuck happened? I was so great in rehearsal. I said, I missed the one. I can't do it. I can't do it from any other place. I need the one. Yeah. And I fumbled. Stomp the yard. I would have been Darren Henson. That's great. I mean, but yeah. Darren Henson is a dancer, so if, Darren Henson is a dancer. Of course, he got. It, you know what I'm saying? He he killed it. Yeah. But yeah, so I I guess I'm kind of a fumbler. Not as much as him though. It's a great fumble story. 
Yeah, that's a great fumble story. Your residuals wouldn't have been the same as his. His fumble's crazy. <sighs> Y'all gonna keep this Jingle shit Jingle money? Going? I, I didn't know. Nigga, you didn't know what publishing was. <laughs> <laughs> I was also 18. 17. I was, I was too. Shit. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was about to say. You know, I knew what publishing was. Why you got to keep was. bringing up old shit? <laughs> you bring up old shit. I didn't bring that story up. That was back then. Stop bringing up old shit. <laughs> so you become the amazing <laughs> photographer. Photographer extraordinaire. <laughs> extraordinaire. For, for many great things that we won't even continue to mention. Um... So how how long is that span of time for you? I mean, because obviously you still you still shoot, you still do your thing. Yeah, I know. But where you were purely focusing on, on photography. photography. No, it was a short short period. Okay. I mean, I, I always collected like you a camera. Always had a camera. With There's you. always a camera. With yeah. Me. Today I I totally forgot to bring the camera because I was doing an interview. I was like, yo, I gotta get a shot of these two dudes. Literally left my camera. Like in the house, and I was like, "Damn, we're not about we're, it. we're not that important." Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. I I know I'll see you guys again. <laughs> we can go back and get that damn camera. <laughs> we're gonna still be here. We're, we're gonna, gonna wait for you to get your yeah. camera. Yeah. So was that like, wasn't damn. like a long period where you were. No, just... No, that was like three years. A good three year run of okay. like, because then DJ started. So how did that kick off? Yeah. So DJ started. Um, you know, I started promoting parties. Um, when I returned to the scene as a web developer, photography, mm -hmm. I, I started to get the music itch again, not as a performer, but just like, yo, I just want to do something with music. Because it, it just, everybody, I couldn't get into parties, even though I was making money. Wait, wait, time out, time out, time out, time out. Yeah. They weren't letting you in? No, they weren't letting me in. That's why I started DJing. I mean, that's why I started throwing parties. Because the party, the party scene in New York was very like, and by the way, this is not, I'm not even being funny. It was like mainly like, like black promoters, like one of the biggest promoters back then, I won't mention his name, but like, yeah, he was like, oh, I know who you are, but you can't come in. And I was like, well, Those were his words. No, those were his, I brought it up to him like maybe about four or five years ago. Like, oh, you remember that? And um, and then I thanked him because I wouldn't have had that desire, that drive, yeah, right, you know, yeah. to, to do this. But they used to like make people come in with like, if you're a dude, yeah, single dude, you had to girls. bring two women with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I never really travel with anybody. I'm always by myself. You know, I'm the same way. And I, you know, he was like, oh, you got to get to the back of the line and you two, two girls. And I'm like, wow. Then I left. And then I went over to like a Q-tip party. Q-tip invited me to a, like his birthday party. And um, that's when I started to see what DJing like really was, like in terms of that style of DJing. So I started throwing parties because no one, no one wanted me to DJ. They didn't. I, I mean... Rightfully so. They had never heard me DJ. I just had this desire, like, yo, I want to spin. And, um, you know, I ended up becoming a party promoter. The thing that I hated about the New York party scene was every party that people did that, you know, like, that was like the cool parties, they were always named after like a candy bar or some shit. It was like Juicy Fruit Tuesdays. And good what? and plenty Sundays. I'm not making this up. Like, <laughs> Juicy good, good and plenty fruit. Sundays. <laughs> I, I ain't going to Juicy Fruit Tuesdays, man. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was always like that. And I was like, man, I joined in on one of them, the Juicy Fruit Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to I just wanted to be associated with something. You know? Oh, and then, um, that, is, you know, that is rich. Juicy you know, Fruit Tuesdays. Juicy Fruit Tuesdays, man. You know, and I, then um, I went from that. I was like, after about six or seven months, I was like, man, I just want it. I want a DJ. Yeah. But I couldn't get any parties. Now, here's where this is everything for me was overlapping. So, you know, web development and photography overlapped. And yeah. then those two things overlapped with me becoming a party promoter slash DJ. So I started phasing the web stuff out because I was having a good time, like on this party scene. I was like, all right. And and what what prompted the move was this meeting. I had this meeting and I was building the website for um for vitamin water for 50. I was shooting part of that campaign. And um and I had to meet with Reebok. So I'm in this, I was in this meeting with um Chris Lighty, Steve Stout. Paul Fireman, who was the CEO, founder of Reebok. Um, Q Gatson, who was like Alan, Alan Iverson's liaison between Reebok and, and, and Alan. Mm -hmm. um, and then this one guy walks in and he walked around the table. He said, what's up to everyone? 
and then he stood in front of me, this white dude stood in front of me, and he, he just stood there. He didn't say anything, and I stood up, and I was like, hey, I'm Derek Jones. And then everybody started laughing because they were all in on the joke. And he said, hey, you know, I went to, I think he may have gone to, like, Boston U, whatever, but he was like, I wrote my thesis on a song from your first album called A Few Dollars More. It was, like, on my first solo album. And um, and then that that was a moment for me when I was like, holy shit, like, the people, I ran, I was running from the music industry. You know, I didn't want to be D-Nice. You know, when I was building websites, I, I didn't introduce myself right. to as D-Nice. I was like, yo, I'm Derek. Like, yeah. But in that moment, that what he said to me resonated. It was like, man, you spend all this time running from who you are. Yeah. And why not just embrace it? You know, like be, maybe not be that same person, like, you know, shopping demos or anything like that, but like be who you are. And because of that conversation, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start. I'm going to go find a club. Because remember, I was pr- pr- promote, pr- promoting uh, Juice Fruit Tuesdays and shit like that. Mm-hmm. I was trying to forget I was like, that. yo. I was trying to forget that you was promoting yeah. Juice Fruit Tuesdays. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I'm going to go find a club that would give me a shot to throw my own party. But then I went to DJs and, you know, yo, cats wanted like, Back then, they wanted five hundred dollars, and I was like, five hundred dollars for a DJ? Like that's crazy! Like, <laughs> oh, shit. I know, right? I'm bugging. <laughs> right. Five hundred? Like you can't even come to me with that? Like you can't? Even... <laughs> I was over here like five hundred dollars a DJ, to a party? I was like, man, I'll do this myself. <laughs> and in the club, I re- I will never forget this. The club was, you know, the in New York City. There's a hotel called the Chelsea mm-hmm. on Twenty Third Street, legendary hotel. Mm-hmm. It's where where Donny Hathaway. Um, not too far. No, actually, no. Donnie, Donnie didn't die there. Donnie died on like 57th Street, I believe, where he, you know, committed suicide. But like, something crazy happened at the Chelsea. I can't remember right now. But mm-hmm. iconic hotel. They had this lounge downstairs, downstairs called uh, Serena. And they hired me. They paid me 150 dollars to drink tickets, and I had to DJ for six hours. Six hours. But I didn't care because I had my daytime web money. That's why you can DJ for three yeah, or four why. days straight yeah. now. Okay, okay. That's it all makes crazy. sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I used sense. to DJ for like six hours for $150. Nobody was in there. Another another buddy of mine, actually right before that, a buddy of mine gave me his club in New York. It was on 23rd Street as well called called True. And I would, I would throw parties there. I would occasionally DJ with my cousin, but the first time that I actually was a DJ – was at Serena's. And the guy that managed Mark Ronson at the time, um, Damon DeGraff, still a great friend. He uh, owns a company called DGI, and they manage a lot of big DJs. He brought me over to this club with Q-Tip and Mark Ronson were DJing called Table 50. And I used to watch them. And I was like, I would just stand there. And the place was small. held like 75 people. Their joint was on Thursday. Their joint was packed. My joint on Wednesday was empty. It was like 10 people, but it didn't matter. I was like, yo, I'm playing music. Have and then one day, Tip and, and Ronson didn't want to DJ. So Damon was like, yo, you know, Tip said you should do Table 50 on their night. And I was like, oh, that's dope. And I went and I tried to DJ. Like, Tip has a very unique style of DJ, and so does Mark. You know, Mark plays a lot of, like, pop stuff now. But then Mark was a straight up hip hop dude. It was like brand Nubians. And, you know, then he would mix in the 80s. And, and Q Tip was strictly soul, James Brown, and all that vibe. So when I went, I tried to DJ like them. And then, and, and, um, and Damon was like, nah, man, just be yourself. Do what you do at Serena, but do it here. I would only play RB, like 80s RB, Tina Marie, Rick yeah. James, when nobody was really rocking all of that, you yeah. know? So, I started playing like that and the crowd was like crazy. I was like, oh, this is this is what it's supposed to feel like, you yeah, know? And, yeah. and then I went from that and then I started, I had um had a night in an, an um a, a, like a legendary night in New York City at a club called Kane on 27th Street. And that became like my residency. I did that for like three years and then I started to build my name, you know, as a private event DJ. With the first private event I did was um was Puff. I went to Puff. Nice. I was like, bro, I got a vibe on the streets right now. Like, he was like, nigga, I've never heard you DJ a day of my life. <laughs> you're not, he was like, you're not DJing my white party. You crazy. I was like, come on, bro. He's like, nah, D, I'm good. He was just like that. Never saw him again. But I was always friends with his assistants because I was always trying to get in there. I was like, I'm going to figure this out. Like, I'm yeah. going to do this yeah, white party. Yeah, yeah. 
man, I ended up with like a night plan a night at this legendary club in New York called Lotus. I remember Lotus. Lotus had a Sunday night party with a drummer and all that vibe. That's why I use the drummer now because it reminds me of yeah, that night. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like the party was crazy on Sundays. So I was the guest DJ. And I got a text from the girls that work for Puff and they said, Puff just asked us where he sh- where should he go tonight? Oh, we sent geez. him there. You got to put on a show. And they sat Puff right at the table right in front. Like, this is the DJ booth. There was one table right here. Puff is on it. He's at the table. Now, I most people, most DJs that, that were hot, midnight, you're playing whatever the new records are. Me, I'm totally reverse. Like, I'm playing Stevie Wonder at midnight when it's packed and I know everybody's dancing. Do I do is coming on. And then that drummer, Puff was standing on that table. He was like, oh my gosh, nigga, this is it. Yo. That's the year he was hosting the VMAs okay, in yeah, Miami. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, yo, you're doing yeah. all my VMA parties. And he's, he kept his word. I, did, I didn't headline them, but he had other DJs. He had Flex. He had yeah. you know, a couple but of house music DJs. But I was on those parties. And then that was like my first time like, like really seeing what it was like to be at the private events. And then I just went private event heavy, you know, Super Bowl stuff. And, and yeah, and slowly phased out the web stuff because it's not that I wasn't interested in it. What I realized about the web stuff was... Um, it was just a means to an end for me. Right. It was something that made me happy because music wasn't being kind to me and I didn't want to lean on music and I wanted people to accept me for who I am. So I taught myself that, but that wasn't my passion. Yeah. My passion has always been music. And to to have an opportunity to DJ these events that I played, and I play R&B, man. You know, I play hip hop, but like mainly my sets are like 75% R&B or pop. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, I'm yeah, playing. Yeah. I'm getting Madonna in there. You know, absolutely. I'm getting all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to play the police. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm, playing yeah, yeah, the police. Yeah, like, I'm playing all of that. Like, yeah, I'm getting that in there. But like, that that, that all ha- happened because, you know, the hip-hop dudes weren't really letting me in. They weren't letting me in the clubs. They wouldn't let me open. So you I found had your go, lane. Yeah, I had to find my own lane, man. And now I play in my own lane. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's crazy. Your story, bro. Yeah, it's nuts. But it's it's a... It's a testament to not giving up one, mm-hmm. but also breaking through that glass ceiling sure. of people saying, oh, this is what you do. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. I do what I want. Yes. Right? That And that's, for us, clearly is what's been our savior, is doing what we want to do. And, and, Taking on whatever comes along with that. Whatever results. But, you know, earlier, you know, when we, before we start filming, you were like, man, y'all niggas crazy. After I played you the song and I was like, yeah, my manager. And you're like, but to a certain degree, yes, we are crazy. But on the flip side of that is we're just enjoying the process and we're enjoying the journey. Yeah. And this music thing that we get to do for a living. Yes. There's... You can't just say that, oh, I can only play one position in this game. I can do what I want to. Because music, for me, and I don't know how you guys feel about it, but music is the last thing that you can purely be completely free in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You get fresh out of jail, do music. You can come off Wall Street, do, do music. music. <laughs> yeah. you can, like, there's no, you don't need any formal education, which sometimes hurts us, but... You don't need anything other than your gift. Mm-hmm. A little luck, too, for sure. Some hard work, but your gift. Your gift will get you through the music business. Yeah. If you let your gift get you through the music business. Sure. You let your gift get you through the music business in so many other ways. Right. Yeah. In so many other ways, because everything that you spoke about is still creative. That's all, I mean, I don't you were just being creative. being creative. You were being yeah. creative the entire time. Yeah. But Wait. other guys would have just been like, ah, oh, man, I just got to go. Oh, I don't know about this. And I'm, I'm getting away from that. And and like you said, you had your dark moments in it. Yeah. But the light of it was that you let your gift guide you. Look, I had my dark moment in this just before the pandemic, you know, like mm-hmm. just being very honest, like. 2020 was supposed to be my last year of DJing. Like, I didn't want to DJ anymore. I was tired. I was like, you know, I kept feeling like, 
you look at certain DJs and they were not judging them, but it's like, yo, why is that person playing there? And I'm not on that same stage. Mm -hmm. I'm a big DJ. In my mind, I felt that I was. I played great music. Like, why am I not given these opportunities? And I realized that a lot of it had to do with, like, ageism. You know, like, that's some real shit, man. Whether it was being black and trying to play in, like, this kind of mainstream world. Because I never just saw myself playing just urban events. Yeah. I was like, no. Because if you go to a non-urban event, they're playing the same exact song. So why am I not playing there? Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, I, I remember going to some of these big clubs and, like, these dudes would, like, literally give me half the budget or maybe a, a third of the budget that they were giving DJs that didn't look like me. And I was cool. yeah. I was okay with it, though. I was like, all right, I just want to be in the room because my goal was never to just be a resident at someone's club. It was like, no, I want to be seen as the person that's playing in places that you don't typically see like DJs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like playing a night that you don't typically see an old school black DJ. Yeah. You know, like, but then after a while, you know, I, I just became exhausted, bro, of like the constant battle, you know, constantly fighting, you know, even with, with our own with our own promoters, you know, like the people that were promoting more R&B. It was still a constant like, oh, we don't have that budget. And and you still do the same job. And then like after fighting and fighting, I was like, man, I'm over these clubs. 2020, I remember calling Live Nation and, and I never worked with a company like Live Nation. I had done like, Jill Scott's picnic, which was, that was a pivotal moment for me. That was like, you know, maybe like seven months before the pandemic. And I played the Jill Scott picnic. It was me. Well, I wasn't a headliner, but it was Jill Scott, Jasmine Sullivan, Music Soul Child, Mace, and I was the opening act. And we were in Philly. Mace missed his flight. So now they're scrambling, trying to figure out what to do to keep people happy. And then the president of Live Nation, Urban, came to me and said, hey, we're going to switch. You're not going to open. Music Soul Child's going to open. You're going to go on after him. And I, I was like, are you fucking crazy? Like, this is yeah. this man's town. Yeah. He's singing so Sean G. Sean G's telling you this. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, no, trust me on this one. You're going to change the whole thing. We can't. We That's, that's the way we want to do it. And I thought he was out of his mind. Yeah. And music went on and he killed and when I got on for my set, it was ridiculous. It was like, by that time it was packed. Right. The energy was crazy. And then I went into it. Cause you know, Jasmine was gonna sing slow R&B songs mm -hmm. and Jill's, you know, she got some not really up tempos, she's gonna but- Jill it. Yeah, she's on chill. It's gonna yeah. be a very- It's vibe. Vibe, sitting down vibe, like some incense and like, you yeah. know, but from my set, it was like- You was gonna go up for a minute. Every nuts. Day. Yeah. yeah. For like an hour, and I was like, "Yo, this is what I need to be doing. I don't need clubs." And then I hit them up like towards the end of the year, like in November, and I was like, "Look, man, I just I don't want to do clubs anymore. If you guys have an opportunity for someone like me to just be an opening act for someone, like, yeah, I, I would I would prefer to do that now because I was I was I was tired, bro. And then they gave me Jill Scott's tour. They gave me ten dates on Jill's twentieth anniversary tour, but we only did one." We did Radio City Music Hall. And it's funny how how this whole thing works. And this is no knock to anyone. This is really about how how life works. I was the opening act. I was the warm-up act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my DJ booth was in front of the curtain. We already the... know where that Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know how that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That joint was at the yeah, front. Yeah, yeah. You got one monitor speaker. Yeah, yeah. You, monitor. you can't mess up what the stage look like. No, you cannot <laughs> mess up like. what the stage looks like. Not, I don't knock it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And but I did that one show and then did a couple of more shows and and then you know obviously like Super Bowl and everything and then and then pandemic hit. So before that though, mm -hmm. before that, because this is this is this is something that was very near and dear to me in, in watching what y'all were doing, you and our brother Kenny Burns. Yes, the nice and right, the show. nice and Burns. Mm -hmm. Yes, right because that was something that kicked off before the pandemic. Yes, and that was. When I say y'all was burning shit Zoo. down, yeah, we were. Y'all we was like on some real fly. We gonna, we gonna, we gonna look good. The music gonna sound good, yes, yes, yes. and we are gonna turn this thing yes. up, right? So that, so is this, is that before you start doing the opener stuff? No, no, it was always Kenny and I've been doing this since like around two thousand and ten. Mm -hmm. Okay, we started doing it with a party in Atlanta called yeah. Soul Fusion, and then we would do it every. 
every like quarterly in Detroit. It wasn't like the way we do. You said quarterly in Detroit. Yeah, because we had a buddy out in Detroit by the name of Dennis Archer. Okay. And Dennis would throw a party out in, in Birmingham, Michigan, and he was just this. You know, he's an attorney. His wife at the time was a judge, and his yeah, dad yeah. used to be the uh, mayor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They had it. Yeah, they had yeah. it going. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. But he was like. He was the dude. He was yeah. like, I mean, he was on the scene. Like, and it's Detroit. Yeah, he would do these fly ass parties and he was like, yo, I need you and Kenny. This is going to be flat. And Kenny and I are like, all right, cool. Kenny's going to host. And this is when we really started doing it uh, together. Yeah. But the thing about Kenny and I, which was dope, we both had our own, we were both unique. We had our own background, our own stories. Right. So we didn't do every show together. We just found like a few, like the wedding and a few things like that that we yeah. would do together. Yeah, y'all, y'all had Tank's wedding. But yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. but whatever we did, whenever we did something, it was special, mm-hmm. you know, and we would kind of reserve that for like Essence Fest or something like that to do like the parties. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, but that stuff, you know, Rockin' with Kenny is is the easiest thing, man, because we know each other's sensibilities, our music sensibilities. Like I know when to switch that up. I know when to change it up because I know if I echo something out, Kenny's going to say the right thing. Right. And then I could just bring something totally different in that would just excite everyone. Yeah. So we never talk about music. We never talk about what he's going to say. It's strictly based on here, based yeah. on this feeling that yeah. we trust each other. And, you know, sometimes he'll come over and be like, yo, trust me, this is the one right here. You know, like, and then I'll play a swag surfing. Yeah. Like, I was never really in the swag surfing, you know, like, because that wasn't my scene. Oh, yeah, no, no. Kenny go crazy when swag surfing. Yeah, he's going to surf. Yeah, he's going to surf. Yeah, he's going, he's to, go, surf. He's going to surf for <laughs> sure. <gonna> surf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, yeah, but, you know, our vibe was always dope, man. And, um, you know, we were we were continuing to build it even more than that pandemic, that pandemic hit. And then it was like, we were separated. And then, you know, because of what happened, it just took my career to like some crazy, crazy heights, man. And um, pandemic. So so when the so when the pandemic hits, yeah yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the initial, right? Because there's the conversation that a lot of us don't talk about of the full shutdown. Like it was so different for a lot of other other industries, but for the music business where we had to literally get out and touch the people. Yes, it went quiet. I'm talking about radio silence. Mm -hmm. So when that first hits, right? Because y'all doing Nice and Burn show. You're doing your own shows. Y'all like, y'all really cooking. You're cooking. Y'all cooking. Y'all moving around. This money seems like it's never ending because it's just, it's like a continuous hit record. True. You can always go get a bag. And then they say, the store's closed. The store is closed. The store was closed, bro. It wasn't closed for me for long, Mm -hmm. but it did feel that way because Mm -hmm. that's when the, you know. So the reason why I went on and played, it wasn't that I was trying to find, like, I wasn't trying to find a hobby or something, you know. Like, I was really just frustrated, bro, because I, you know, I'm self-managed. I've always been self-managed. I got a team, but, like, it's me. I handle the deals, you know. Like, I talk to everyone because... You know, for someone like myself, you know, I I just always, I knew when to make the right deals. Like, I knew when to say, no, I'm not going to charge that person that amount of money because I see what this deal is going to do, who's going to be in that room. Mm -hmm. They may not have this budget. You know, sometimes when you have representation, they just, people just want to take, take, and take. And I never really operated that way. I was always like, nah, oh, what makes sense? Yeah. What makes sense for you? What makes sense for me? You know, and, uh, you know, and uh, when, when the pandemic hit, you know, when I was home by myself, look, you guys travel a lot, you know, like I know who you are and what you both accomplish in your careers. We're never home, mm-hmm. you know, but you were also in a relationship, you know, married at the time. I don't know what your status is, but like there was always someone home making sure that home was great. Right. Yeah. I was never home. You know what I mean? Like I had moved to L.A. a year before. So a pandemic, I wasn't home until the day before the shutdown. So I had no food. I, wow. Everybody had broken into the stores, you know? So I was in the stores and I'm, you know, at the time, I, you know, I had a little bit of paper. Didn't matter. I had to buy lima beans, you know what I mean? And, and protein bars, you know, and, and, you know, just things that I don't, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, whatever whatever it is that I could get for, for this two weeks because everything was shutting down. And, you know, when I was sitting at home and I was looking around, I was like, man, 
I didn't like where I lived because I had moved to LA a year before, but I was never home to never take there. time yeah. to like. You even, didn't even really know where you lived. <clears throat> yeah, I did, like decorate. I had like four pictures on the wall when you walk through the door. That's literally it. No art, nothing. I didn't personalize anything. You know, the sofa that I had in there was was a sofa that I had in my New York apartment, which was much smaller. And now I'm in this spacious kind of loft. So when I was looking around, I was like, man, you mean I got to sit in here for like for weeks by myself? This is what I did. And I was frustrated, you know, like, so when I got up that morning and um, and I went live for the first time on Instagram, um, because I'd never used Instagram live. I used Facebook live, you know, um, for Essence Fest, but I never did all of the live stuff and, uh, what was the other one? Periscope. Yeah, yeah, Periscope. Yeah, never yeah, did any yeah. of that. I'm like, who wants to look at me? You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't, I didn't see what what it what it could have become. You know, like I was just on some who wants to sit there and like spy on someone's life. You know what I mean? Like, so it wasn't my vibe until I sat there at that counter, and I was like, man, I'm just gonna play some music and tell some stories. And I opened my laptop up, selected a song. And I started, I know what the first song was. It I was, was just about to ask you. Yeah, it was a song called um, Rising to the Top, Kenny Burke. Uh-huh. And I, that was my first song. And I started my IG, queued that up, and I started telling stories about being a kid. Like, yo, I was like, oh my gosh, there was 200 people in here. This is kind of cool. Like, yo. Yeah, yeah. Like, yo. And then I would see, like, my friends in there, Chuck Bone and this one. And I was like, we're all in there. Blue Williams. And, like, yeah. I was like, oh, yo. No, you know, no DJ gears, just my laptop with the phone sitting there and I'm looking at it reading like, yo, this is crazy. Like, yo, I'm going to play this song from like when I used to walk in the clubs in like 1986 when I first came on the scene and Brucey e. B was playing this and this was, this was like the anthem. This was the Queen's anthem and this was what they were playing in Harlem where Brucey e. B was DJing at the rooftop and I play a song. And then people were like commenting, like, yo, this is dope. Blah, the blah, engagement. Blah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yo, and I wouldn't even play the full song because I knew you could you you couldn't play music on Instagram. Yeah. I would just play a little bit of it. Then I would switch it up, like, yo, remember, you know, this Dennis Edward joint would just rock it, and I would play a little bit of that. That's literally how it started. And I did that for like hours, like three hours on the first day. And it was like 280 people. And then I I, I knew John Legend had started doing his thing too. So the next day. I hit Hassan Smith up. I was like, yo, I just noticed that you can go live with someone. You think John would go live with me? He was like, yeah, I'll call just your man. I'll call him. So he called John. Then I started calling all my old school hip hop friends. Like, yo, I called Dougie Fresh. I was like, Doug, yo, go live to me and say hi to the people. Like, I had never done a live yet. Say hi to the people. <laughs> <laughs> I, was to, I was just trying to make the shit fly. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. yo, just come in. And Doug was like, I don't even know how. He tried, but he didn't know how to join the conversation. Yo, it's way more people than Doug that did Joe how to get on there. He couldn't figure it out. Yo, Doug couldn't figure it out. Then the first person that I went live with was, I believe, Al B. Sure. Mm-hmm. It was Al B. Sure that went live with me first. And he was, you know, he was all on his Al well Might as well kick it off with the R&B. Yeah, kick it off with R&B. You know, you might as well kick it off with, with the Al B. went live lady. with me. And uh, Kane went live with me. Dave Chappelle went live with me, but not he didn't have an Instagram, so it went from his <laughs> wife's account. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> they was just watching TV, and then they were they had the music going on in the background, with me on the background, but they was just partying. But Dave went live and talked to the people, and then um, the one that I noticed because I wasn't paying attention to how it works. Now remember, I, I'm a programmer. When I went live with John Legend, and he had his daughter Lula on his shoulders, and we were just he was just saying hi to the people. I looked at the numbers, and my numbers went from like that. It was like at that time floating around three hundred. The joint says six thousand, and I was like, "Wait, what the fuck just happened?" Right. And then usually, like when I'm done, I just analyze everything, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, it's telling people, it's notifying that other person's like whoever they're on whoever with, whoever they're on with, is yeah. telling their it's people. telling their people yeah. that they're live." Because that joint went to six thousand, and then when he left, it went down to one thousand. Like now, I got a thousand people in there, right. and I was like, "Oh shit!" Like no one knew all of that. Some of his people was, saved with you. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. was early. Mm-hmm. No one was using IG Live like that. This, no one like it's, in that week, it increased seventy five percent because of what I was doing. Like no bullshit. So no one knew what was going on, like, and I saw that, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is crazy!" 
And I wasn't DJing. This was now I'm just having like conversation and playing songs and then back to the and then I decided to call it a party. Cause I called I called Clark Kent up and I was like, yo, bro, like this actually feels real. You know, like you know, I don't know, like the I'm happy in here. My speakers are loud, so it felt like I was in the club. I was like, hey. but you at this point too, you're in an apartment. I'm not, I was in an apartment. So neighbors banging on the walls. Just, oh, the neighbors. How did you? How did you deal with that? I mean, well, they, they couldn't were, kick you out. It was the pandemic, so it wasn't like they could get you <laughs> they me out. But they <laughs> but, would bang on the walls, and it yeah. was like, yeah, very annoying. It felt uncomfortable because I'm not. A, I don't like confrontation, and I also like respecting people's space. Yeah, but I, I they didn't see what I was seeing. Course. What I was seeing did was they, like, did they know that D Nice was next? No, door? they didn't no. know that. They just thought some. They didn't know. Yeah, they didn't, but they also, <laughs> even uh, if, not. they didn't even know who D Nice was, though. Right, like, because right. I ended up meeting the neighbors. They had no idea who I was, which is a funny story too. But like, when I called Clark, I was like, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna name this a party, because before that, people started reaching out to me. Now, like, you know, you know, chicken spots. You know, got the call from like someone from Wingstop that was like, "Yo, let us." No, no, I knew, this. I knew it was cracking. When a girl asked me, she was like, "And she knows you too," but she was like, um, "Do you know where? Do you know where? Do you know where Derek lives?" <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, listen, listen. No, no, it was no. crazy. Bro. I said, "I don't." <laughs> She's like, "Would you? Would you mind like you know just calling him and getting his address? Because I wanted, I just want to take him something." Like, I just want to deliver it. I'll just leave it at the door. I just, you know, he's just over there by himself. Wow. I'm like, oh, he's cracking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was crazy. JT, get him, JT, get him. Jay -Z. Jay -Z. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah, no, it, it was They just crazy. want to drop off the food. Yeah, then I started getting food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm was, pretty, I'm pretty, listen, we won't say it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure yep. I called you and got your address. So you, yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were sending food. <laughs> They would have the chefs make like, yo, it was that first week was like things things flipped quickly. Like, and it was really because I never I didn't ask anybody for anything. Like, mm -hmm. I was just like, yo, I'm just gonna play some music because this feels good. Like I was a then I became addicted to it. Then I was like, yo, I'm gonna when Clark said that, I was like, I'm gonna go and get some gear, because I didn't have DJ gear at home. And I made it to like Guitar Center like 30 minutes before they closed. If I didn't make it there, I wouldn't have, none of this happens, you know, but I made it there. Well, you well, had no gear, sure. No, I didn't believe in having like gear at home. You know what I'm saying? Like I lived in an apartment. I didn't want to walk in my living room and see you like, see, yeah. like turntables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that just wasn't sexy to me. Yeah. You know, um, so I didn't have anything, but like now I'm stuck in the house. I need something. And um, man, I bought that controller and then that's when I posted homeschool. And this dude right here was like, don't call it homeschool. <laughs> That's terrible, man. I was like, it's homeschool. Why because... am I that guy? <laughs> why, why am I that guy? That dude, like... I thought I was, yo, I thought I was on to something. I was like, it's homeschool. Yeah, yeah. I'm teaching these cats about music. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yo, I'm educating you on the classics right now. He, like... he always gonna call you with the that ain't it, chief. <laughs> yo, he definitely said that, that ain't, ain't it, man. He was like, What? What do you mean? I'm hot. No. You're He's not. like, nah, that's not it. And I'm like, hey, homeschool, like, that's cool. You should call it club quarantine. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I owe you on that one. Man. Wow. My brother. He was My like, brother. Yo, you should call it club quarantine. People thought I stole the name club quarantine from other people. And I'm like, yo, I really just got it from this dude. <laughs> right, right. Maybe he did. But I didn't. No, listen. No disclaimer, no not disclaimer, no disclaimer. No, I just, for me... That's what it was. That's what it it was That's what it was. club quarantine. It was yeah. you yeah. literally brought the club the to the quarantine. quarantine. It was yeah. now if someone else was saying it, I don't know either because I but I wasn't watching anybody else, yeah. so I wouldn't oh, even know. People you know were definitely I mean? like, "Yo, I had club quarantine," and like, I'm like, "I, I didn't, didn't know." And me neither. If you did, if you started around the yours same wasn't time, cracking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It became a whole nother monster where like monster. you were actually talking to people and telling yeah, yeah. people what you was drinking yeah, yeah. and what you about to order from the bar and yeah, like. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I'm doing the running man right now. What you do? Like yeah, once it, crazy. When it no, became that, it no, was the like, commentary was the best. Oh, the commentary was the best. Was, that's that's the the best. best. And then you see real different people tap in. You yeah. see them blue checks and people like, oh no, it my was, god, it was going up. Oh it was, god. It was no, no, crazy. it was it was going What's up, man. Up? I mean, I think aside from your gift, which obviously drove it, it was the fact that people were genuinely they were genuinely happy for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
because yes, all of us that had encountered you in real life yeah. knew the guy you were. Yeah. And we were really happy about something good happening to a good person. Absolutely. Yeah. And That's I think awesome, that was something that pushed us mm -hmm. to promote, to talk about it, to tap in, to, you know what I mean? Like, like just like you said, you just, you like, man, I just be random, I randomly called Jay about different things. But just even that, it was like, no, this is my friend. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, he cracking. And we've all had friends who get cracking. Yes. But it was different, I think, for everybody associated with you. Yeah. Because we were just like, he deserved this. Yeah. Because everybody hadn't experienced a D-Nice party either. No. This was That's the first true. Because you became yeah. very corporate for a minute. Yeah. Where you was, I was, I was before, very corporate. Where you was getting your corporate back. Yeah. And you just were, you know what I mean? You wasn't at every single club. They nope. couldn't experience you like that. This so gave now them a chance. it gave, this gave them a everybody chance. a chance. Gave everybody a chance. Middle America. Yeah. And and you put R and B in a different oh, heavy. space. Heavy. Yeah. Heavy. Heavy R and B. You put R and B in that yep. totally yeah. Yeah. different. Yeah. Space. Love the records you and Neo did. Yeah, man. Oh, Love you it. Just, I mean, like, yeah, like you was really tapping in. It, it's it's yeah. You you did so much with with that one thing. Like you I mean, it's monumental. So to see how it grew into like going to the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> Man. Yeah, that was crazy. Bro, the Hollywood Bowl rocking like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> that was nuts. We're, we're going back next year too though. Yeah, that was crazy. It was nuts. As you should. Yeah, yeah. That's to me, that is where that's what CQ represents. Mm -hmm. Because that was like the entire pan the entire um <clears throat> early part of the pandemic. All I imagined, I couldn't think of any other place that that felt like. I was like, man, when the world opens up, I just want to play the Hollywood Bowl because the Hollywood Bowl was the reason why I moved to LA. I had gone to a concert there, like a Lauren Hill concert. And I was it was Lauren Hill and like Dave Chappelle. And I'm like, yo, you mean you can party outside? Yeah. <laughs> and I've never been there. Like, wait, you can yeah. sit here and party and drink wine in your own box and order food? No, it's I was fly. Like, it's fly. Yo, they had blankets. I was like, <laughs> they had blankets. Hip hop party with blankets. <laughs> like, yeah, you, know, you got blankets. Hey, listen. You got some off and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. yo. And here's, of here's the full kicker of Club Quarantine. Yo, bro. The prettiest women in the entire oh, yeah. world. No, no, I definitely have some beautiful followers. Oh bro. my god! Uh, like I'm like I'm like Tank. I'm like an R&B uh, singer. <laughs> listen, like you and Tank. Right listen, one, one night, one night, because because one night, you know, I used to be fooling around, and I'm in there playing music. I would always get kicked off for playing songs for way too long, playing songs that are way too nasty. Right, yeah, yeah, and yeah. one night, D Nice literally brought his people. I was like, Yo, go over here. We're going to go, let's flood his page. I turned all the way up. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, oh, y'all, okay. Y'all didn't know it could get this nasty, did yeah. you? <laughs> I didn't know he was that nasty. I'm like, God dang. <laughs> I was like, where's he running these records? I'm, I'm just happy that, you know, some of the corporate people, maybe they were there, maybe they weren't. But, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Nah, but you know what's so funny, though? I was in the basement. There's, I'm going to leave her name out, but she's a huge, huge, she's huge at one of the film companies. Mm -hmm. Like huge, like CEO type huge, yeah. like, and I had a chance to speak with her in in like about a week ago, and she was with a buddy. She was like, you know, she knew that we knew each other, and he put her on the phone. And man, this woman, she was like, you have no idea. I love you. Like I listen to you in the middle of the night. So that means she was listening to the slow songs that I was playing. Yeah. I was extra nasty. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Hmm. Like she was like, yo, I would wake up, I would shower, then you were on. Like it really became a it, it became a thing. And it yeah. was something that people really looked forward to. Yeah. You know, and that's and to me, that's what made like the Hollywood Bowl and, and these gigs that I have so special. Is that when you look into that audience, you see a little bit of everyone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you yeah. see a little bit of everyone from different backgrounds mm -hmm. and cultures and like because that's what it represented, man. Like, you know, and the thing that made it easy was the music that I played represented love. Yeah. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. really thug it out. No, 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 no. Absolutely. I think I went in your comments and tried to get you to thug it out a couple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was not going there. <laughs> no, you lifted us up. Because in my mind, yeah. 
what I saw on the other end of the phone was people listening with their families. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted yeah. to be respectful of that. You know, I have, yeah. you know, at the time she was eight, you know, I have an eight year old, you know, I don't want to hear like crazy. We was dancing know. right in that kitchen with the kids. No, yeah. for sure. Walked for sure. Like, we danced with Kid our kids. Yeah. And, and, yeah. You know, like, yeah. so that was, that, that, that was on my mind. And I remember like, um, a few months ago, like one of my friends was in town and she came over and, um, she just stopped by. She was like, do you mind if I stop by for a minute? I want you to meet this kid. And she pulled up. Her friend was driving. They pulled up, and I went outside, put the hat on. I'm thinking I'm going to meet, like, a kid, like, you know, eight or nine. She rolled down the back window, and this kid turned around, and his eyes lit up, and she said, who is that, baby? And this little kid was two years old, and he was like, it's D-Nice. Wow. And I thought about it. Wow. I was like Elmo to this kid because I was always probably <laughs> on his mother's screens or on the, yeah. you know, in the kitchen, you know, yeah. like. That's all he wow. saw for like two years, so like it to even to the kids it means something. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's wild, bro. That's it's crazy. wild, and it's it's. I don't want to say wild in a negative way. It's no, just, no, it's, it's no. just beautiful, man. Yeah. Like yeah. to know your music, your music. You know, Stevie Wonder, David Bowie. You know, Level Forty Two. Like all of this music kept people dancing. You dance in your kitchen and shit that you probably didn't even know, but it just felt good. And your kids were dancing. You're just yeah. having a good time, and yeah. you know you probably were in there ki- in the kitchen cooking, and the vibes felt good. And then next thing you know, like now you know that song. Like not too many people was playing Melbourne Moore. Yeah, you know right, right now. Right. You know Shout, out right. Shout out to Melbourne Moore. Right. Shout out to Melbourne Moore. Like yeah. Melbourne, Melbourne because is in I every now day. now I, I I now interact with Melbourne Moore yes. because of Club Quarantine. Wow. Yeah. Stephanie Mills yeah, and like yeah, full yeah. legends. Sheila yeah. E was in there every yeah. day. Now Rogers, forget about it. Now I was in there every day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, yo. And then now it's like when they see me out, they're like, yo, you know, like Melba, Melba just, she's getting her star on the Hollywood um, Walk of Fame. And when she posted about it, she was like, yo, I owe I owe a lot of this to D Nice because he reminded people who I am. Who you, you know, are, and like yeah. when you see an icon leave comments like that, it's like, wow, like, you know. I don't want to make it light, you know, that I was just playing music, but I selected those songs to play when the world was listening because I wanted to remind people of what what love felt like musically, like sonically. This this feels like love, you know. Wow. Even if you didn't know what they were singing, yo, that rhythm you felt something. Yeah. You how felt could you it. not? How could you put on David Bowie's fame and not feel like you want to lean your hat to the side or yeah. something like right, 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 with the right, drums yeah. and yeah. and that guitar? Like, oh, you just want a head nod. How, you know what I mean? Like, how could you not play like, you know, uh, um, Marvin Gaye, Distant Lover? Yeah. And not feel like you want to pour a glass of wine in front of mm-hmm. the world. Like, yo, this is what we're listening to right now. Let's, this is it right now. We we used to slow dance. Let's slow dance together all over the world in your living rooms. Yeah. Yeah. So I couldn't have like a Hollywood Bowl without having Tank. You know what I mean? Because I was playing those records in the middle of the night. Like, yeah. yo. Everyone knew what Tank record I was playing. <laughs> I was playing dirty like crazy, yo. <laughs> yeah. Dap you up yeah. on that yeah. reserve. Come on, man. Yeah. That dirty record. Yeah, I was slow. like, I played it one day and I was like, God damn. Yeah. This shit is nasty, but it's sexy. Yeah. It's just... All types of what I'm doing with this pillow and all Pregn- this. And pregnancy like, music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, I yeah. put your face in the pillow. I was yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. Yo, I, hold on, yeah. hold on. So listen, yeah. so listen. I dim the lights. So, on, so, so listen, on, on that note, on that note, <laughs> Nice, you're a superstar, right? And you've, you've had success before. You've been known before. But now you are, you are an international star. Yeah. How does that feel? Because it's, it's, it's different. And managing yeah. that is different. It's different, you know, like before before the world opened up and when this thing was like blowing up crazy, I was on the Zoom call with like, it was like Puff, Jay, Lenny S. It was Lenny S.'s birthday and we we're all in the Zoom. And I was I was still on CQ DJing, but I would play a song and run back to the laptop. And like, and I'm in this whole conversation wow. with everyone. And like, and then Jay kept going, yo, how does it feel? And I'm like, what are you talking about, bro? He was like, how does it feel? He's like, no, nah, not really. I'm not trying to be an asshole. Like, how does it feel? I was like, yo, bro, I had success before. He was like, no, no, no. You had success. You had a couple of hit records. But this is different. I didn't yeah. know what he meant. Yeah. Right. Because I was still at this home. This is Jay-Z asking you. This is right. Jay-Z like, yo, <laughs> right. 
I was still at home, so I'm like, I don't know what this dude is talking you about. You ain't been and, outside and Lenny, with your new, your new fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At this been. point, right? I, you know, I was like, Lenny S was like, "Yo, Jay, chill, man, chill." Like, he was like, "No, I really want to know because this is different." I didn't know until, till we put that Hollywood Bowl on sale. Yeah, give, give the people how fast that thing sold yeah, out. Yeah, that thing man. sold out in like four days, man. Like the Hollywood, the Hollywood Bowl. Hollywood Bowl, yeah, like in like four, four or five days, sold out, sold out, and then they were reserving some tickets because it was selling so quickly that they held a bunch of tickets because they were like, yo, we got to make sure like artists got tickets or whatever. But then when they released the artist tickets, those joints sold, you know what I'm saying? And it was like, <laughs> holy shit, you know? And like the one thing that mattered the most to me, well, one of the things that mattered the most, not even the one thing, but it goes back to the day of like opening for Jill and remembering where they had me, not Jill per se, just never want to say it's about the artist. But like, you know, when they set up everything, they're like, oh, he's just a DJ. And having that DJ booth in that corner, I was like, my joint is going to be front and center. <laughs> I need a castle, a LED wall. Well, I was like, yeah. yo, I'm going to yeah. have I'm everything. I'm top on top. But I also wanted to make sure that every artist felt love when they came out, that yeah. it switched from my logo to this big ass tank on the, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. Every time someone walked out because it was, that's what I I personally feel like I represented inclusion and love and like, you know, we're all doing this together, you know. So, you know, I just remember sitting in that dressing room and, and Tank was sitting there. He was like, you're a DJ. You sold out the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. wild. Like, yeah. what the hell? Yeah. I've never played the Hollywood Bowl. Like, I've never played the Hollywood Bowl. He's like, yo, you got the Hollywood Bowl. Like, this is wild. And that's, that's why I'm playing like, you know, like when, you know, I plan Carnegie Hall next week, man. Wow. And that, you know, that that feels crazy too, where I'm like, man, I got my own night at Carnegie Hall. Like I Amazing. I went specifically to Carnegie Hall to see, you know, how they have like the little billboard posters on the side of the on the side of the building. And as I walked up, and it's funny, as I walked up, um, one of the guys from New Kids on the Block was walking up at the same time and he, he was like, yo, D, turn around and him. And I was like, yo, I'm trying to find my poster. And he was like, I'll go with you. And then we walked over and just stood there together. And we were both sitting there, like, because they had never played Carnegie Hall either. And um, I think he's working on something right now for Carnegie. But, like, we just stood there and we just looked at him and was like, man, this is wild. This is some wild shit, man. Like, so not only did it, it make me or, you know, kind of put the spotlight on me with fans. And, like, I was able to just play all of the music. But I've also met a lot of artists that I just personally adore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, like you and I, all three of us, we've always been cool. But like, I think the pandemic slowed everything down and like seeing your names pop in all the time. It was like, yo, these are my brothers. You know I what agree. I mean? Like you could have just been doing your own thing, but you chose to come and you chose to be like, yo, you should call it club quarantine or whatever. You know, first person I heard about, you know, doing the bowl because I didn't know how to ask artists. Yeah. I didn't know, yeah. like, yeah. yo, I want, I want to see if some artists will come out. I didn't know how to ask. I was like, man, I didn't know I had your number, but I was like, I can't call this man. Like, I don't, I don't want him to say no, so I called him. <laughs> He's like, nah, Tank, Tank, do that, man. Nah, Tank, could do it. And and you did, you did most of them, bro. And you know, like, I, I got so much. I didn't want to be not on any. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's like Jay. So when, did, what's, what's, what's the schedule? Said, when what's, is, what's, what's his schedule? schedule? Where's he the going nice to be? schedule. <laughs> I'm pulling up. I'm pulling he up. He said, I'm pulling up. Yo, yeah. Pay for that, my flight. I'll get there. Yeah. Yo, he's like, don't yeah. even worry about it. You know, yeah. like, yo, I just want to be there and that. Come on, man. Like, No, but we're we're really about brotherhood, man. Yeah. Like, seriously. Like, we don't we don't say that as just some, you know, slogan or some little, you know, tagline. Like, we really mean it. Like, when we fool with you, we fool with you. I mean, obviously, you've seen that with us. Yes, absolutely. And... I think we've been a we've been in this industry long enough to see the other side of it. The foolishness, the dark side, the you know, the crab in the barrel, the whole thing. And instead of complaining about that, we just like we'll just operate different. We we'll operate different. Yeah. yeah. And the people that we choose to deal with will operate different with them. Mm -hmm. So that they know, oh, these guys move in a different space and hopefully you know, as corny as it may sound, hopefully somebody will experience that with us. Yes, bro. and then 
pass it and move it and pay it, pay for, it yeah. forward. Yeah. That's not corny at all, bro. Mm-hmm. Like that's the way it's supposed to be. Pay it forward. You know, like and that's that's the vibe I'm on, man. Like I, I just want to share it with people, you know, mm-hmm. like yeah. even even the artists that I select, you know, like a lot of artists, you know, when you talk about like a Hollywood Bowl or you talk about a Carnegie, you know, they have that many like hip hop artists and most black artists that played the stage weren't really R and B. They were doing like jazz or or you it definitely know, wasn't rap. Definitely right, wasn't rap. Right. You right. And you're incorporating um, all of that. So I'm incorporating that, you know, like you know, I got I got Kane and I got Jada kids. He's gonna do we gonna make it at Carnegie Ooh. Hall with the orchestra. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm on that mission. I'm like, how do we how do oh, we like start God. incorporating real music and not just the drummer? Yeah. Like because normally if dudes aren't on tour with a string section at all. And a horn section, yeah. That's all synthesizer, you know what I mean? Like and stems and no, bro. I'm like we still gonna have the elements of that record because I'm still DJing, but I, you know, I created a whole set list for like the artist and the way it's gonna flow, so they can write charts to it, so they understand. Like I want this. They get the real experience. Yeah, wow. and it's like a DJ experience, but with these live elements that. So you still gonna be hear? So crazy. Yeah, it's bro. That's gonna be nuts. That part, like, oh, man, I I wake up every day thinking about that, man. Yeah. Like, man, this is going to be. Like the whole thing, you know, CL Smooth doing they reminisce over you with real horns. Out of here. With strings on top of it. Huh. Yeah. I'm excited, bro. All right, brother. Well, we got to pick your brain. All right, let's do it. A couple seconds, you know. You play a lot of R&B. Yes. A lot. Plethora. Okay. I want you to give me your top five R&B artists. My top five R&B artists that I love to play, um, Stevie Wonder, Prince. I love playing Michael Jackson. I love playing um, Marvin Gaye. Mm. And I love Shaka Khan. That's a cold list. That's strong. Yeah, yeah. That is a cold list. Yeah, yeah. That's what I I love playing. Yeah. You know, there are going to be some Beyonce records and all that. But in terms of like... Yeah, five is good. What I love from my spirit yeah. when I play that as a DJ. Well, hold on. Let's get into it. Let's get into that. Top five R&B songs or albums. You can mix it in or you can just go songs. Or just, no, we go, so, from, from a DJ's perspective, yeah. song. No, song. I can do songs. I do can songs. do yeah, songs. songs. Yeah, yeah. songs. Um, there's a Prince song that I, I, I don't, it's, it's something about these, these chord progressions that I just love. It's a song called Dirty Minds. Like you probably don't know that song, no, but you know that Mines. one. Yeah, I love Prince. you know Dirty Minds. I love Prince. Oh yeah, yeah. Dirty Minds. Yo, yeah. there's just something about that record that when I play that, you know, Tank grew up in the church, so oh he, true, true. He didn't get true. to hear like my mama's <laughs> favorite artist and the only light skinned man she was ever in love with it was Prince. <laughs> was Prince. My mama, you know, she she high yellow. She she only loved dark skinned men. Yes, but Prince, he was that the one light skinned. That so record, yes, I, I grew record, up. I grew up listening to Prince. That record moves me. Um, Alexander O'Neill and Sherelle Saturday Love. Come on now, mm-hmm. yeah, that moves me. Yeah, you know, like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, let me think of another. Oh, Stevie wanted to do I do. Yeah, yeah. That that moves. I mean, am I the only one that hears Ja Rule every time that comes on now though? I don't hear Jaru. Hey, like I, giving I, it up and say, no, it's just me. <laughs> okay, I right, fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, well, that's, that's three. <laughs> that's three. Um, Man, I, I, there's a shocker in there. I'm, I'm just trying to decide which shocker. I know you, I live you. Do you know that song? I don't know that record. Oh my gosh, Shaka Khan! I know you, I live you. I'm about if to you go, play it, yeah. I know it. Yeah, if I play, I know it, your, I know your set list. If yeah, you yeah. play it, I know it. I just can't. Yeah, name yeah. Shaka, and I song. can't sing because I would, I would be singing right now. You sure you don't want to try that? No, I don't want to try. Okay. That. You don't want to just do like I did with Jaru? No, no, no. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Number five. Number five. Number five song that I enjoy playing, All About the Benjamins. I can't even lie. Guys. <laughs> Yo. I'm going to take that. Yo, I'm going to take, take that. I'm going to take that. Every time I play okay, that record, I'm like, oh. Hey, what? I don't <laughs> care where you are. I know we said R&B, but I nah, just nah, 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 nah. Benjamins, come that. on. And Puff needs to be in the conversation when yeah, R&B man. is brought up. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? Because he's not only a rap legend, 
He's an R&B, R&B legend. legend. You yes. got to really go and figure out Puff Daddy. Absolutely. And what he's done in he's R&B. An R&B legend, yeah, absolutely. Man. He's an R&B legend. But, but that um, record, man. That shout record. out to Love. Let's make an R&B Voltron. Who are you going to take the vocals from? Who are you going to take the artistry from in terms of style and and the visual? And who are you going to oh, take the man. performance from? Those three pieces. Let's start with the vocals. Who are you going to get the vocals from? Uh, Prince for the vocals. Mm. Mm-hmm. Prince could do anything with vocally. He was able anything, to do anything. Anything, anything. for sure. You know, um, style. What you want your artist to look like? What you want them to put on? Lenny Kravitz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lenny, Lenny. Wee. Yeah, Lenny, Lenny Ooh. Kravitz. Yeah, yeah. Let me put that okay. shit on. I, 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 I see what you're doing though with the whole Prince vocal and Lenny yeah, Kravitz. Yeah, no, no, he, Yeah, I see where you no, at. Yeah. Yeah, no, I see where you at. It's, it's yeah, getting yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah. performance. 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 Um, damn, that's that's a that's a tough one for me. Yeah. Michael was a dope performer, but like, it wouldn't go with that style. Like old Michael. Like young Michael, when he was a kid, that Lenny Kravitz look was his style. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. His mother yeah, used to make all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like I used to like, I was never really into like big stadium Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. Young kid Mike with the hat to the side, like yeah, dancing. Yeah, yeah. And on he, the player, he just, yeah. he was just, like his player. Yeah, yeah, man, like yeah. with a child's heart. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I knew exactly what you was talking about. So like that that style of performance, but yeah, but not with the Prince vocals and the Lenny look. So who would that be? Oh my goodness, Teddy Pendergrass when he was like mm. when he was Teddy because P. he made he made yeah. women Yeah with the open silk shirt. With the open silk shirt. Yeah. Yo, Teddy. Might might be three, four chains on. Oh, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Might be little little taco meat, little yeah. taco yeah. meat. Yeah. I mean, and that yeah, yeah. husky voice. And it was aggressive. He was aggressive, yo. He <laughs> was aggressive. You got, you got, you got what just, I need. Just think about the way he sang Turn Them Off. Turn Them Off. No, he screamed at her. He screamed. <laughs> he's about to play that in the car, he's, headed he's, back home. He like, screamed yo. at her, bro. Turn them off. <laughs> but he was a performer, though. You turn them goddamn lights off. He was scary. <laughs> he was a performer. <laughs> like, I don't even think you could do what he did back then. Throw an all-women concert? You can. You can't? You can. Oh, you, you can. can. You can. You can. He's... Man, Absolutely. listen, it's 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 coming back. Yes, it's coming oh, back. It's, yeah, yeah, it's Close coming. It's doors. coming back. We've we're we've <laughs> go, we've He's gone like, through a we we've on gone that? through this stage of trying to be cool for each other instead of being cool for who we need to be cool for mm-hmm. the woman. Yeah, that's yeah. who we really need to be cool for yeah. because everything it's revolves it. around that. And we've been in this space, but it's it's coming back. It's you coming think back. I put on suits in front of Instagram Live for you. <laughs> <laughs> for you, I hope not, brother. No man, I hope nobody not. hit us. Yo, listen, I was like, <laughs> good to see you all. I was like, yo, there was one of my friends called me, and she said this was probably like the first after the first weekend of like really blowing up, and she said, no, I'm gonna say exactly what she said. So excuse the language, ladies. Turn up. She was like, she called me. She said, yo. You're gonna have these bitches falling in love with you. I'm like, what are you talking about? She was like, D, your whole audience, nothing but women. And at that point, nobody was connecting it to their TVs. You were literally holding it in your phone. Mm-hmm. And she was like, these women are just looking at you. Like for hours. And that's all they're looking at is you. Yeah. 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 This is crazy. And you're playing the music that they love. Yeah. They gonna think you sing these songs, and I was like, "You are <laughs> tripping, yo!" She was right? They definitely gonna connect yo. you to the essence. Oh, word! They definitely did. Like, you know, women used to find where I lived and show up downstairs with the kids waiting. Like, wait, did you say with the kids? Yo, with the kids. Like yo. these are our kids now. I had to tell one. I like how he said. Wait, wait, hold on. He's about to say something though. You had to tell one what? I had to tell one woman because I went downstairs. I thought um, it was. I thought it was. Um, like LL used LL was kind enough to like have his chef make food for me. You know what I mean? That's like, amazing. Like as a one time gift. Like yo. So then I ended up. Her name is Chef Sugarfoot. She's always on IG. Chef but like Sugarfoot. But like her, her you know food what is she in. do? Oh yeah, she gets busy. But you know, when when I was expecting this delivery from her, so when concierge called and was like, "Hey, 
there's someone here for you. It, that person was coming at the same exact time. So I was like, oh, let me go down and get yeah, the food. Yeah, yeah. So I was hungry. You know, I hadn't had a real home cooked meal like that. So, and I'm looking for a woman with food. And all I saw was like this woman with like two kids. And then I went over and I was like, hey, are you here for me? She was like, yes, it's me. Like during the pandemic, a lot of people were lonely and dudes used to prey on women. So they would create like a fake D nice account and be like, Oh no, this is my private. No, no, this is D nice. This is my private account. You know, I'm going to talk to you from here. So it made them think that they were talking to me. And I was like, and then she had a kids and I was like, man, you weren't talking to me, you know, like, unfortunately, you know, plus you shouldn't bring your girls out to just meet someone like that. You know, like it doesn't really, you know, it's not going to be good for them. You know, it's not, it's very dangerous out here. But it used to be a lot of things like that. You know, like one woman, man, she moved from Chicago. She left her husband. I'm not making this up. I had never what? spoken to this woman ever. Not one, not one conversation. And she moved to LA. So I made the mistake. This is why I moved into my house. Because when I first moved to LA, I only had like 150,000 Instagram followers. So, it, you know, wherever I took pictures didn't matter. You know, I remember sitting on my sofa and I lived across the street from the Staples Center and I took this dope picture. But all if you had gone back through my Instagram, you knew you exactly where I lived. I lived. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I wasn't expecting what happened to happen, you know, to yeah. where like yeah. pandemic hits and then nine, millions of followers now. Like I would have never done that. Um, but this, yo, women, there were so many crazy stories, man. Like, you know, one of my favorite ones was, uh, you know, this woman sent me a video Cause I used to, when I would do like my CQ after dark and I was playing taint dirty and I, I dim the lights. Mm -hmm. I'm licking my lips and shit. You know what I'm yeah, saying? People yeah, are home. Full, this. full tank vibe. Yo, full tank I'm vibe. All these, this. these are my songs. I'm bringing it. it back. I'm playing with the buttons. They started calling me spirit fingers. And oh, I'm like, man. I'm doing this and I'm talking. Buttons. Yo, I'm over here like, yo, I'm gonna I'm play with it. I'm gonna let this breathe. Yeah. I'm gonna play with it. Yeah. Then I would slow it down and stop the record. Boom, boom. Now pressing the pads, boom, 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 doom, doom, doom. Two fingers, baby, two fingers. Like that was oh, you out of control. I'm, I was out of control, you bro. I was entertaining control. myself. I love that. Yo, <laughs> couple beverages in. <laughs> Yo, exactly. <laughs> Definitely beverages. Yo, this woman sent me a video. She was naked. Yeah. She had the iPad. She was holding the iPad up with her with her knees. Mm -hmm. She had her phone, mm -hmm. and then she was masturbating. With me in the background, yeah. when I'm like, yo, and you can hear me saying, yo, let me play with it. And she's like, yeah, play with it, baby. And she's like, master me. And I was like, yo, this is wild. Yeah. This is wild. I'm so excited <laughs> for you. <laughs> you said I'm excited <laughs> for you. I was like, no, nah, I got to chill with this, man. Listen. I DJ for presidents. I got to chill. Babe, no, you do <laughs> we, not. You <laughs> DJ for <laughs> everyone. Don't you ever chill. <laughs> <laughs> he said, don't you ever chill. <laughs> yo. Oh wow. man, no, the R and B life is crazy, man. Welcome. Yeah. Thank God I couldn't yeah. sing, because then I would probably be out of control. Man. Listen, you're you you are fine the way you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'm good. You're play, doing the right. Play, play the record. I, 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 I was about to say we had another segment for you, but his his, his this, no, 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 we, no, no, we, no, 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 no. Yeah, he's right. not getting out of here okay. without all right. The uh -oh. Segment. All right. Wait, what's the segment? So we have a segment. It's called I ain't saying no names. Because there's some names that he cannot say. Yeah. Yeah. But there's some stories he can tell. Yeah. Okay. So the the name of this, uh, like I said, it's it's the the segment is called I ain't saying no names, and the story can either be funny or fucked up, or both. Damn. The only rule. Don't say it. no names. Can't say no names. I ain't saying no names. Damn, I don't know if I have one of those stories. Though. Yes, you do. No, I, I, yes, you do. No, I don't. I ain't saying no story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know if I have. <clears throat> Damn. Nah, I really don't. And it don't know. even have to be from, you don't got to be from club quarantine. No, no, I'm thinking about it. You know what I mean? You've lived five different lives, my brother. A lot of lives. Yeah, but I don't retain the information, though. That's the problem, though. I'm, I'm being serious. Like, yeah, I don't keep it. It's like, I mean, there's somebody who I'm still trying to figure out if I slept with her back in the day, because I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, did I? I don't know because the way she showed me so much love and like sometimes you just gotta ask. <laughs> he said sometimes you just gotta ask. I'm like, Did we? sometimes you just gotta ask. I just left it alone. I was Are like, you sure we didn't? And D nice is just. <clears throat> I mean, nice. that's our first L. 
<laughs> on the ice saying no name. Throw some tomatoes at D Night <laughs> on the comments. Out of about, all of those stories I, I gave you, no he gave all the good stories. <laughs> all and the then he could give us another one where he just didn't say the name. Oh man, you know what? No, you know what? Listen, I know it's somebody crazy that slid in your DM, man. And you don't want to say it. it's it's fine. It's fine. It's you don't want to tell us. I'm, you know you don't what? Give us no no we'll, information. It's we'll, so we'll walk away on top. It's, it's fine. fine. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. It's, listen, I do have a story that I'll tell because this is actually an important story. So, and I and I won't say any names. Hey. When I when I was on the scene, like really just starting to bubble hard in New York, a person that I know was playing like a huge, huge event for the Oscars, like huge, and you know, and uh, and he was extremely arrogant. But we were cool. But when he got that gig, he was like. I was like, man, you gonna play that? And I was like, yo, one day I wanna play that. And he said, you'll never play it. Mm. Like literally said that. And then you fast forward and I'm not gonna tell you which Oscar party, but it was one of the, I played four of them this last Oscars. I played the Oscars, I played the Governor's Ball, I played Vanity Fair, and I played the Gao Siri Madonna party. And that guy was my opening act at the very party. You know what I'm saying? Like. That's be nice just, to people. Yeah, you got to be nice, be nice to, to people. people. You got to be nice to people. You know, like, and I did get a kick out of that. Like, of nah, you guys have to honor my writer request. Even though I could have, you know, removed a couple of things. It was like, no, 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 no. Because I, I remember that conversation like a decade ago. And then here we are. And I was like, oh, I made it. Yeah, but I won't say any names. So that's my story. Yeah, that's it. So you, so you didn't take the L. You didn't take the L. Yeah. Four. Four. Four pockets full. Four. Ain't that what little baby called? No, that's what it is. With all of the pockets, is, yeah, all, um, your, all your pockets is full. Ladies and gentlemen, um, man, I, the brother, man, just just an amazing brother, beautiful brother, Be man. Nice. Um, brother we've all been rooting for. And you getting it well deserved. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And thank we you love, and we love that you getting. I am Tank. I'm Jay Valentine. And this is Mister Mister D Nice. And this has been the R and B Money Podcast. Hey, come on, baby. yes. Come on, baby. R and B Money.